Just Star. Where are you from originally? The cart hit a bump, jostling me in the small cramped space. I was headed north to the kingdom. Riding the caravan that traveled between the cities and the land south of them. The pony who agreed to let me ride along with his wares said he could get me as far as Saints Parish. He refused to go to Annapolis. A pony would have to be crazy to get near that place. Saints Parish is my limit, he said sternly. I took a spot in the back of his wagon, and that's where I've been for the past day. As the pony slowly proceeded north, he was a nice stallion. He didn't even ask for the caps. He tried to strike up conversation with me a few times, but I wasn't in the mood, and kept quiet. After a while, he gave up and left me alone in my sorrow and anger. Even now, I couldn't stop myself from remembering those last moments. Someone I watched, another of my friend, take her last breath. Someone I loved. As much as I tried, I couldn't stop the rush of memories that came flowing into me, like a tidal wave. I remember the look on everyone's faces as one of the doctors in the room where they were treating Aura said those words. Time of death, 9.32 p.m. Sheena had cursed in Zira and pushed the doctor back. No, we are not giving up on her. Empress, she's gone. We need to call it. Don't do this to her friends. The first doctor said. Sheena looked back at the doctor and said in a stern tone, No, we are not giving up. If you aren't going to do anything else, then leave. If you are the kind of physician that would simply simplify death in such a way, then we do not need you here. Everything else they said between them was nothing but a mumbled blur to me. Tears fell freely down my face. I swore I wouldn't cry anymore, but there was no stopping them. Or was the strongest griffin I knew. She was so beautiful, smart, so great. Now she was just a corpse, as dead as the rest of the poor souls who lost the game the Wasteland loved to play. I finally realized that the Wasteland is a living entity, given life by the radioactive destruction brought on by the war that happened so long ago. I took a step back. Aura, no. Please, no. Windthrasher was also watching in horror, but when I stopped moving, she looked at me with tears streaming down her face. Shadow? I'm going to kill him. And he will suffer a thousand deaths, worse than a thousand for each death. She took a step towards me. What are you talking about, Shadow? She tried to take hold of my hoof, but I pulled away. He killed her. This is all his fault. I'm gonna make him pay. I'm gonna make him regret ever touching her. Once I'm finished with him, I'm going to kill every last pony in the Enclave that he works for. I'm going to kill them all! You're upset, I understand. But you're not thinking straight. When Thrasher said, trying to grab my hoof again. Before she could, I turned and ran down the hall. I heard Wind Thrasher yell something, but I just kept on running. Knowing I couldn't outrun her, I activated my magic and teleported as far as I could. I found myself in the courtyard. I only stopped for a moment so I could get my bearings. I still haven't recovered from my fight, and the spell took a lot out of me. It only took a moment. Once I felt a little better, I ran past the gates of the mansion. I didn't stop running till I reached the other side of the kingdom. It was there that I found the caravan that was just getting ready to head north. I meant what I said. I had nothing left to lose now. Stardust wasn't a pony. I used to know, but he was just another enclave soldier that needed to be slain. I knew where he was going to be. I had his old sniper rifle. I wasn't going to meet him and turn myself over like I said I would. I was going to blast his fucking brains out. Then, once Stardust was dead, I was going after Nightshade. I don't care what I was told about him, or if he was the pony who said he wanted to protect me so many years ago. He was the one who gave Stardust his orders. As far as I could see it, he was responsible for taking Aura away from me, as Stardust was. The Enclave already hated me. They wanted me either dead or captured, all for Mom's Mark II, or for whatever other reason they could come up with. I'm going to give them a real reason to fear me. To hate me. To want me dead. I'm going to kill every last Pegasus I could, until they were all dead. Or I was. Either way, it was the only way I could put an end to this. It's the only way that I could keep my last of my friends safe. Now I was on my way to the city 
that was said to be a horrible place to go. It was filled with gangs, raiders, criminals, and zebras. Most ponies would say it was stupid to try and go to a place like that. But I don't care. None of them scared me anymore. I only had one destination. Mill City Tower. The infamous spire that pierced through the skyline of the city. From the small amount of conversation I did have with the caravan pony, he told me that it used to be the tallest building in Annapolis. Now it was only one of the skyscrapers left standing in one piece. He also told me that the ground forces of the Enclave used to use it as a base since it was nearly impossible to access for the gangs and away from the normal citizens who lived in Saint's Parish. I wasn't worried about that. I wasn't sure how yet, but I'd find a way inside and hopefully be able to obliterate whoever lived there. Thanks to the radio ponies at Up and Atom, I know that Nightshade will be there. If I couldn't find my way inside, then I still had an ace up my sleeve. I tried my hardest to take my mind off things as I watched a vast amount of dead pastures, hills, and trees go by through a small hole in the cloth of the covered wagon. This place was even deader and drier than the Mojave Wasteland. The Northwoods Wasteland looked like a place that had been manufactured by the bombs for ponies to continuously die 200 years later. That's exactly what it was going to do to my friends. Aura was shot by Stardust. And Stardust had his mind warped by a machine invented by ponies that lived here. This land should be purged from the country we once knew as the nation of Equestria. Wiped clean. I put my eye up to the hole so I could see ahead of the wagon and saw we were closing in on our destination. In the distance, I could see through the mild green and brown haze of the crumbling, desolate buildings that made up the Twin Cities. It looked even more horrible than the land surrounding it. At least Winnapolis hadn't looked so bad. I couldn't tell what Saint's Parish looked like because of the giant wall surrounding it. From this distance, the wall looked pretty decent compared to the others I've seen surrounding Freedom and the Strip, but not as good as Trotston's. From what I can tell, it was made of brick. A little mismatched, but that didn't look like it was just thrown together by random ponies willing to help protect the farm, the town, from various forms of mayhem. We passed a sign that said, now entering Lakewood, population 61,938. The part that said the population had been crossed out with spray paint and replaced with a skull and crossbones, splattered with blood that had dried long ago. I crawled to the front of the wagon and asked the caravanner, Do you mind if I turn on the radio for a little while? Not at all. Music will help pass the time, he replied. I switched on the radio and music started to play. It was a stallion singing very passionately about a mare laughing in violet rain. How to be violet? Was it acid rain and they were immune to it or something? I guess it was because it was a song made before my time that I didn't understand the lyrics. Even though I didn't understand the song, it still made me feel like crying some more because of its slow rhythm. The various instruments playing in the background, setting a scene in my head of me and Aura in a thunderstorm casually staring at each other as violet droplets washed away the blood and dirt while purple lightning flashed overhead. We came closer to each other as the guitar solo led to a series of vocalists singing ho 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 ho, and came into a tight embrace as the instruments played their final notes and she disappeared with a peaceful smile. The song faded and I had a strange feeling that even though things ended the way they did, she was at peace. Perhaps she heard my words before she crashed. Or she was haunting me as a lonely ghost in the veil. There was a book series I remember reading while in school in the stable about vampire ponies and how they died and went to a place called the Veil as ghosts to spend that eternity alone watching over their loved ones. It's a sad fate, but still a sort of peaceful one nonetheless because she could see her friends every waking minute until they true drew their last breaths, bringing her to a final resting peace to ascend to the goddesses and be reunited with them. And suppose if I ever want to talk with her again, I could see if Squirrel and Moose have some way to do a sort of seance. There was a long moment of static on the radio while I was alone with my thoughts, and then the radio ponies started to speak. That was Violet Rain by Blue Note, our local music legend who was discovered at our very own First Boulevard in downtown Minneapolis 240 years ago. Coming up, after our next song is the late night edition of Up and Atom. See you there!
Up next, we have a song by another Winapolis native band, White Twilight by Midnight Owl. Yet another song played and made me feel sad. This one was actually about losing a loved one. The electronic sound reminded me of some of the dubstep I heard on the radio before, but with far less bass and with a lot calmer, smoother sound. I imagined myself laying in a bed beneath the stars in a moonlight that looked like morning, almost. A strange phenomenon that somehow let it be light outside while still showing the vast sky of twinkling stars. As I gazed at this beauty, stars shot away and created black cutouts in the sky of feathers revealing distant red nebulas at the tips of them. Goddesses. The radio can be so cruel to emotions, constantly tugging on my heartstrings reminding me of the pains that ail me. As the digital sound became louder and more upbeat, I turned my head to the imaginary mattress to see Aura, watching the stars with me, a glow with transparent like a wandering spirit from the heavens above. I reached out to her as the song came to an end and slightly disturbed the feathers on her chest, making them ruffle a bit before she once again faded away like a candle losing its flame. A theme song came up on the radio for a few seconds and then Poker Chip's voice came through the radio waves. Ah, uh, Pan Adam! Hello, every pony, and welcome to this late night edition of Up and Adam. I'm Poker Chip. I'm Bitmap. And don't forget everyone's favorite griffin, Kitty here. Poker Chip continued. Yep, we're here once again bringing you the news, music, and other forms of media that may or may not make you smile, laugh, or cry. Anyway, let's talk about these latest reports around the area. Bitmap cleared his throat. You always have to make me give the bad news. Why can't you just do it every time? I heard Poker Chip let out a soft chuckle. Because I'm technically the boss. I can make you do anything. Bitmap sighed. It's not like you pay us or anything, but anyway, here goes. Earlier this evening, a contacted mercenary Grifton was fatally shot in the newest edition of the infamous Seven Deadly Sins of Equinity. Pride, just outside of the kingdom. We aren't sure about all the details yet, but reports from the Kingdom medical staff say that she perished around 9.30pm, and was apparently a friend of the Courier, a heroic postal service worker from New Pegasus. This comes after Envy was sighted south of the Kingdom a day or two ago. Kitty sounded as she was ready to cry. That's so sad. And to think, you knew the news and played songs like that on the radio before the show. Didn't you think about her friends who lost her and how they felt? Pokership answered with, <laughs> Of course we did. We're not heartless. Excepting that the f it's the first part of grieving process. We were just trying to move that process along a little. When a friend of mine died, music helped me get through it, and kept me from drowning myself in sorrow. Believe me, my heart goes out to the courier and her friends. Loss isn't an easy thing to deal with, even in the death-hungry wasteland. Anyway, we should move on. All right, then. Bitmap continued. There's also been word that groups of Enclave soldiers have gathered around Mill City Tower, as added security for upcoming meetings. Poker Chip interrupted. They must be preparing for something and someone big if they have that much security around the tower. I know Nightshade, the new council pony, is going to be there, but with so much security, I'm sure there's going to be more Enclave officials there. The question is, why would they meet there and not up in the clouds? Kitty spoke up. Maybe it's the safest place to do so without the risk of eavesdropping. Or at least, a uh, deceased risk. Come on. You know some ponies bound to eavesdrop no matter what their allegiances are to the Grand Pegasus Enclave. If I were to guess, it's probably about something horrible like wiping out Winapolis for good by getting rid of the crime problem there. Bitmap finally got to speak again and said, I don't really think they destroy that crap hole any further. Kitty sighed. That's not what I meant by wipe out. What I meant was a kind of epic purge of the incredible amount of gangs, raiders, and other criminals that populate the city. Poker Chip must have been close to his microphone because I could swear I heard him scratching his chin. Hmm. To be honest, it's not the worst idea I've ever had. I, I actually have no problem with it. The concerning part, though, is still the Enclave. So they probably won't stop at criminals. They'll probably kill some of the innocent citizens that live in that murderous place. Who knows? Maybe they'll get rid of the MCNT guys. 
I don't like thinking about the impending demise of other radio hosts, but they do need to get taken off the air somehow. Kitty scoffed. I can't believe you'd say something like that. Shame on you, Polka Chip. I'm surprised Bitmap didn't say anything before I did. Bitmap sounded like he was stammering a bit. W well, it's not like it can be helped. They're idiots that broadcast that crime riddled place. Bitmap! Kitty exclaimed. I can't believe you two. You guys are cruel. Poker Chip sighed. Sorry, Kitty. I guess broadcasting news like this for so many years has turned us a bit cold. So moving on from that shameful subject, reports from up north near Branch say there's been an explosion during a drug lab near the grain silos in the center of town. Luckily, none of the resulting flames reached the silos, but there were some fatalities, one of them being a local drug dealer and manufacturer by the name of Chemical Ice. According to the residents of Branch, he wasn't just a normal drug dealer, but also the town's pharmacist. I guess sometimes ponies can have a good side and a bad side. If you call a pharmacist that also deals with directing drugs good. Yeah, if you think about it, he could have been adding something to the meds he sold to the pharmacist to get more customers on the side of his business, Bitmap said. Well, there's always a chance that both his businesses were completely legitimate. Kitty said. Poker Chip cleared his throat a bit. <laughs> yeah, but operation of a drug lab with a chance of explosions so close to the grain silos was pretty careless. If anything made a spark or set a fire within a certain distance of those things, bye-bye branch. That whole town would be blown to smithereens, wiped off the map, turned to dust. With how big those things are, they could have the potential to cause an explosion so massive that it rivals the mega spills of the war. Kitty gasped. What? Really? Those things could blow up and cause destruction like that? Bitmap answered before Poker Chip could. That's right. In fact, before the war, those silos exploded. Some, after some teenagers decided to hide behind them to spark up some questionable zebra herbs and get stoned. Before it was called Branched, it went by a different name. But unfortunately, I don't know what the previous name was. All I know about it was that they were half full and caused a massive explosion that wiped out most of the town. Kitty sighed once more. Jeez, that's just terrible. Why are teenagers so ignorant? Didn't they teach them that the molecules released in the air by grain is highly reactive and can excite electrons and sparks and fire? Pogrenship laughed. <laughs> yeah, they probably did, but they clearly didn't listen as well as you must have when learning about it. Anyway, it looks like that's all the time we have for the Twin Cities. This has been Up and Adam. Thank you for listening. Stay safe out there. Coming up next is a track we can all bob our heads to. It's an attraction by Daft Pony, the dynamic duo from France. Enjoy! The song that came on was another love song about one lover losing the other, those assholes. However, it was a good song. I especially loved the beat and the chorus. I thought about what they said about the silos and branch. I guess I'm not the only one that caused the destruction out in the wasteland. It seems like there's a lot of ponies out here that are a lot dumber than I am. It seems to be hard to believe with the mistakes I've made. Half the time I cause mayhem by looking at something and saying, Ooh, what does this button do? Or by making the wrong decision morally. I also thought about Mill City Tower, where Poker Chip and the other two said Nightshade to be. With increased security they were talking about, I had no idea how I was going to get into that building to extract my revenge on Stardust and Nightshade for what they put me through. I may be able to snipe them with Stardust's rifle from another building, Wait, that won't work. I'm an idiot. That's the only super tall building in Annapolis. I would doubt I'd be able to sneak past the Enclave troops on the ground, let alone in the sky. I'll think of something, or maybe I'll just go in guns blazing. Ugh. Why is this so hard? Why is what so hard? The caravaner asked. Oh, nothing. Just trying to come up with a plan of sorts. I replied nonchalantly. Maybe I can help. He retorted. Not with this, you can't. I don't want to involve someone innocent with what I'm doing. I said solemnly. I see. So you're planning on doing something really bad, huh? He asked, trying to guess. Not really bad, just very, very bloody. I replied quickly to satisfy his curiosity. Oh, you're some kind of merc? He asked again. No, just a courier delivering a package that contains death. 
Don't worry, that's metaphorical. I'm not carrying a bomb or anything. I explained. Well, I hope you keep safe in your endeavor. By the way, we're almost at the gates of Saints Parish. I gotta make a little delivery to Scorchville. It's a small settlement a few miles outside of Parish. I gotta warn you about something, though. The residents are... A little weird, he said. Weird? How? I asked. He sighed. How should I put this? They're a cult of followers of some autonomous robot. I don't know why they do it, but the robot seems friendly enough, and they've never attacked me. And here I thought there were strange ponies in the Marve. Those ponies follow a robot, for goddess' sakes. Must be some robot. How long is this stop going to take? Shouldn't be more than an hour. It's in the middle of the night, but the town should still have ponies around to receive the supply deliveries. Honestly, I don't think they ever sleep. But I know that's impossible. Every pony needs sleep, he replied. I sighed at the minor inconvenience. All right. I guess I'll take a little while to myself. Maybe check out this robot they're all so fond. Scorchville wasn't what I expected. Something that was starting to happen a lot as of late. There was supposed to be an abandoned town that was recently populated by the robot and the cult that followed. But it looked pretty lively for just being started recently. The caravanner was unloading supplies from the wagon as I started to stroll through the little town. I was growing increasingly more curious about the so-called robot they all followed, but couldn't find it anywhere. It was like trying to find a lost foal in a giant crowd of rolled out muscle heads. I walked over to one of the ponies, waiting by what looked like the door to his home, and asked, Where's this robot I've heard so much about? His face brightened up. Oh, you're looking for serendipity? Don't worry, she'll find you if you're looking for her. She? Her? Isn't she a robot? Wait a sec. If I refer to ro robots as an it, it might may not sound well when I call Watts he or him. Oh, she may be a robot, but she does have voice and characteristics of a mare. I assure you that serendipity is a she, he replied simply. I let out a bit of an annoyed sigh. You said she'd find me if I'm looking for her. How is she going to do that if she doesn't know where I am or who I am? He smiled. That's something you'll find out soon enough when she eventually comes to meet you. Ugh. These ponies aren't just nuts for following a robot. They're complete morons, too. I said goodbye as kindly as I could without being a bitch, and walked away to sit on a nearby bench with a cracked and crumbling street. I yawned and checked the time of my pip buck. 3.13 a.m. How the hell are these ponies still awake? Suddenly, I felt a presence behind me and turned around. Ah! How long have you been standing there? You are about to do something catastrophically deadly in Winnapolis, the robotic pony said. She had a meticulously well-designed exterior. Her body looked like it was made of an extravagant ivory with some gold detailing. I looked down at her hooves to search for where the strange sound was coming from and saw that her knees had pistons working in them. It was probably how she was able to move. I looked back at her glowing orange eyes, somewhat hidden behind the black silk that made up her mane, you must be serendipity? That is correct. I am serendipity. A prototype crusader mainframe. You are Shadowstar, the courier from New Pegasus. You're here wanting, waiting for the caravan to be ready to leave again, so you can kill Nightshade in Mill City Tower. She said, surprising the hell out of me. Baffled, I asked, How? How did I know all of that? She interrupted. Let us just say that I know what's going to happen before you do. Am I going to... I started to ask before she interrupted again. Sorry, I cannot tell you if you're going to kill Stardust or Nightshade or not. It's not because I don't know. It's because no pony should know too much about their own future. There could be terrible consequences resulting in a singularity that would swallow up the whole of Equus, meaning its destruction. However, I can say that you do something catastrophic at Mill City Tower. The constant interruption was starting to get on my nerves. I sighed. If you wouldn't mind, could you please stop interrupting me? It is a bit rude, and I prefer to ask complete questions before getting an answer. 
I watched the gears in her pupils turn as I waited for an answer. Yes, I can do that. Actually, I knew you were going to ask that, but since I did, I decided it would be better to let you ask anyway. Okay, moving on now. Why do these ponies follow you? I tried asking, to wrap my head around the whole situation. They worship my ability to project the future happenings at a rate of 99.9%. .9%. I don't really mind them following me around, but sometimes it can be problematic. Due to them technically being a cult, they sometimes get targeted by different factions until one of them targets them, realizing what the cult is about. Sometimes, when that happens, more ponies join them. The Incarnate Torch, the stallion who maintains my body, thinks they're all imbeciles, Serendipity replied. Is he the one that created you? Incarnate Torch, I mean, I asked. No, I didn't create her. Another pony said from next to me. Goddesses! Would pony stop sneaking up on me like that? I exclaimed, almost comedically. He gave me a look. What are you talking about? I've been here the whole time. You just didn't notice. Anyway, no. I didn't create serendipity. I wish I would've, because whoever created her is a genius. A complete, mobile, self-sustained, future-predictive crusader mainframe is nothing short of amazing. A long time ago, she passed by where I was living at the time, and I took an immediate fascination with her beautifully crafted circuits. This was starting to go a bit over my head. So, you became a cultist to follow her because you like her circuits? Don't you think that sounds a bit strange? He gave me a look that told me I should start wearing a sign that says I'm stupid, so the ponies will know not to rely on my brain power. Not at all. And correction, I am not a cultist. I have nothing to do with those worshipping morons who think of her as some sort of robotic goddess. I follow her so that I can learn more about her abilities to predict the future and conduct maintenance whenever she needs it. So you're like a robot repair pony, like from before the war? I asked, sounding like a gigantic idiot. Of course, that's what he was. What else would he be? Her fucking butler? Sort of. Serendipity isn't simply a robot. Her maintenance requires skills and finesse in order to not damage her in any way. I know I am at least doing something right, because if I wasn't, she wouldn't let me work on her, because she can predict if something is going to hurt or destroy her, he explained. Cool. So she's like a super calculator? I said casually. Not necessarily. A supercalculator is a massive computer system that runs off the energy produced by a special kind of spark battery and requires constant cooling liquid, via liquid nitrogen chambers. She's almost nothing like a supercomputer. Well, except for the massive computing power she possesses to process data used in predictive future events. He explained further. I hate feeling like a dumbass in front of smart ponies. And a robot, I guess. Okay. My slightly tired brain is starting to hurt from trying to absorb all this information. Anyway, one more question for you, Serendipity. Why do you travel from place to place? From what I've gathered from everyone in here, you travel the wasteland. She looked at me as if I asked a strange question, which was surprising because I was pretty sure she already knew what I was going to ask. Maybe it was the 0.01% that predicted wrong. I am looking for my creator. I know he isn't dead, even though it has been a long time since the war ended. He is what you would call a ghoul. Unfortunately, he programmed me so I wouldn't know who he is until I eventually figured it out, or he told me. Why would he do something like that? I asked, prying a bit. Well, it's not as bad as you think. He programmed me to that way to enhance my learning ability, to figure out problems my own way, while in turn evolving my predictive abilities. Also, I believe that it was a secret project he was working on when I was created, and if asked, I wouldn't know his name. I used to know what he looked like before the war, but he wiped his features from my memory for some reason. Serendipity explained in detail. Sounds like a dick to me, I commented casually. She looked like she was smiling. Not really. More annoying than anything, or at least a pony like you would think he was annoying. I looked around and studied the town again. Why did you decide to settle here in Scorchville? 
She sighed, which I didn't know a robot could do. So I could meet you. I was originally going to go quite a bit south to the kingdom, but here was a higher probability that you would be passing through instead of there. The probability changed when you did something to further upset the seven sins of Quinity, and subsequently followed by envy. However, you did stop in the first place I predicted, but weren't conscious at the time. Well, not the whole time. It was amazing that she knew I wasn't conscious when we stopped to change the spark batteries in the sky carriage. I was watching a memory orb when we were stopped. I was out of the one a couple minutes when we got there. I suppose that amount of time wouldn't have been enough for you to determine if it was a better place to meet or not. By the way, why did you want to meet me? That is an easy one. Because I am 85.7% sure that you've met my creator at least once. Unfortunately, it seems he didn't tell you about me, when and if you did meet him. I know because you aren't going to say anything anytime soon about who he is. She replied. Oh, sorry about that. Anyway, it looks like the caravan's about to leave, so I should get going. Maybe I'll see you again sometime in New Pegasus, I said as I arose from the branch. She turned and walked away and said, You will see me again very soon. Goodbye for now, carrier, and be wary of your choices in the future. As I walked to the wagon, I thought about a ghoul that I've met recently that could be her creator. The only two I could come up with were Mr. Tops and Nexus. Mr. Tops I didn't find annoying, but 200 years can change a pony. But then there was a the fact that he wasn't a ghoul, or at least said he wasn't. Nexus, on the other hoof, was excruciatingly annoying at times, but I don't think he's smart enough to have created something like Serendipity. Plus, with how much he loves his tech, he would have probably gloated over it or sent me on a mission to find her. She said I'd see her again very soon. Maybe then I'll have an answer. At least, she helped me take my mind off things for a little while. As the caravaner hooked up the wagon, I crawled back onto the rear of the wagon and decided to sleep a little. How was your day, Stardust? From the look on your face, it seems like it sucked balls. I asked as me, Aura, and Stardust sat at the counter of a bar. Ugh. Work was fine, I guess. Designing weapons isn't that hard or anything, but my sister has to work in the same area as I do and get on my ass all day about when I'm going to finally settle down and start a family. I'm not the domesticated type. I work to get money and that's about it. I pay my rent and blow the rest of my pay on food and random shit I don't need. He replied glumly. You have a sister? Nora asked. I sighed and he rolled his eyes. Yeah, technically I guess. You already knew that, though. She's the annoying spawn of my birth parents after I was given up for adoption. When I searched them out, she was the first pony to turn up. Goddesses. I hate explaining things more than once. You didn't tell me anything about it, I said, now curious about who this mysterious pony was. Oh, I told you about it when I first started searching for my real family. You were the one that agreed with Aura that there was no way Doorstop could be my real father, because of all the strange verbal abuse and gay jokes, he explained. Nora started to snicker and almost spit out a drink. It's not like you've had a mare friend recently, so I could see why he says things like that. Correction. I've been trying to get Shortcake to go on a date with me for the past six months to no avail. Just because a mare won't go out with me doesn't make me what he calls a fruit, he retorted, taking a sip of his rum and cola. Then from behind me, doorstop boomed. Are you saying you ain't no dick-sucking flower after all? Stardust just put up his hooves and exclaimed, Yes! Bullshit! I bet you can suck a golf ball through a garden hose. If you ever shout at me like that without preparation for some kind of retribution, I'll make sure you never forget that again. When you were still in high school, I was gonna try and straighten out that attitude of yours with that little... In your face discipline, but you're too damn tall. Then I thought to myself, maybe life will help you learn some respect without hard, dirty work. But then I realized a sissy like you couldn't handle a dirty job because they don't stack shit that high. Doorstop retorted. I sat there with my mouth hanging open. I can't believe they actually let a pony like that adopt a foal. He turned on me. I wasn't always like this. 
I actually used to smile out of joy. Not sick humor brought on by bringing down his ego a peg or two. Aura smiled from the other side of Stardust. I wish I could bring his ego down like that. Maybe he'd be a little more tolerable. Stardust rounded on Aura and said, Bang! You're dead. Should have expected retribution. At that, my eyes locked on Nora as blood started stroking her feathers and dropping from her beak. Everything went black except for her, and she said, Why couldn't you save me, Shadow? Okay, this is seriously fucked. What the fuck is going on? Why was I at a bar? I need to get Aura some help. A doctor, a hospital, something. Suddenly, she was lying in my hooves, bleeding out, and we were both covered in dirt, grime, and her blood as I heard a strange beeping coming from somewhere. The beeping sped up as she raised her talon and touched my face. Then the beep became a solid sound as Zora's talon went limp. Ah! No! I shouted as I woke up from my not-so-peaceful slumber in the back of the wagon. You all right back there? The caravaner asked. I sniffed and wiped away my mix of tears and sweat from my face. I'm fine. Just a nightmare is all. Ugh, sorry to hear that. You want to talk about it? He asked, as if he was genuinely interested in my problems. No, you probably wouldn't understand, I replied. Okay, then, he said. Sorry, it's just a bit private is all, I said solemnly. It's all right. I have things like that of my own I don't want to talk about. I guess the Wasteland has more targets than just me. Are we almost there? I asked as I looked out through the small hole, quickly getting my answer. Yeah, we're here. Just waiting in the entrance line to Saints Parish. Caravan routes are pretty busy this time of year, so the line's pretty long. He replied. I think it's time we part ways. I shouldn't go into Saints Parish without my friends. In there, I'm sure there are enclave patrols just waiting for someone to do something they can enforce the law. I'm wanted by the enclave. Not as sure a fugitive would be able to get through there so easily. I said as I started gathering my things. He scratched his head. That's fine with me, and all, but if you're heading for Mill City, then you'll have to go through Saints Parish. But don't they do cart checks at the entrances? I asked. Right. I almost forgot about that. They use some pretty invasive scanners to check the carts, which means you probably won't be able to hide anywhere back here. He answered. I thought about what I could do to get through the city and enter the route to Annapolis. For everything I came up with sounded either like suicide or extremely moronic. I couldn't just dress up as a bush and sneak step by step through the metropolis. Is there any other way I can get through to Annapolis from here? He looked lost in thought for a moment. I suppose you could walk along the wall of Saints Parish. If you do so, though, I suggest you stick pretty close to it. There's guard towers along the walls every 500 feet or so. So if you were planning to walk too far away from the wall, the guards are bound to see you. It might still be dark, but not for long. Plus, they have night vision installed on their helmets, so they can see you no matter how dark your coat is. I thought about the way he suggested for a bit and made my decision. I think I'm going to go along the wall. It's too risky to try and sneak in through Saints Parish. Also, there's the fact that it's a shorter route considering Saints Parish doesn't completely go under the south side of Annapolis. Just part way. You're right about that one. Although, it would bring you closer to Mill City Tower if you risked going through Saints Parish. He explained. I think it's best that I don't go through the city. I'll take my chances going around. Anyway, I should go now while I'm still out of sight of the guards' gates. So, I'll be seeing you then, I said as I hopped back out of the wagon. All right, your choice is your choice. Safe travels, he responded as I started to walk along the large wall. I wish this duster wasn't made in Goddess's damned desert where it's hot all the time. Holy Princess Luna's frozen glass dildo it's cold in here. I hate the Midwest. I checked my pit buck to see what the current temperature was, and the answer surprised me. Only 55 degrees? Pretty sure it gets colder at night in the Marave. Must just be the damn moisture in the air that's getting on me. Great. Talking to myself again. Maybe it'll get warmer in the, as the morning presses. 
The sun might not be visible during the day, but some warmth gets through the thick cloud layer. I could tell the sun would be coming up soon because the sky was turning slightly brighter in the east, and it was already past 6 a.m. I just hope it gets at least a little warmer. My body hasn't accumulated acclimated to this climate yet, and I don't want to have to look forward to freezing my ass off every night. Honestly, it's tolerable enough to be able to ignore for a while, but when the wind blows, I get plastered with chills. I flipped on the radio again to take my mind off not just the cold, but that I was also thinking about Aura again. I quickly switched off the radio when I remembered the guard ponies along the wall. I wouldn't want to catch their attention and get caught. Getting myself captured by them because of my own stupidity would totally defeat the purpose of not giving myself up to Stardust. Ah, Stardust. I keep thinking about what I'm going to do with him, and the memories of our travel together came flooding in. The day I met him was the most sarcastic dickhead thing I'd ever met. But then over time, we became friends. A, th a friend I thought I couldn't live without. What if I can't pull the trigger? And what if he ends up killing me and then the others? There's no way of knowing what will happen. Unless, of course, I was like serendipity. I walked along the wall and saw Old Mill City. It looked more ruined up close than it did at a distance. Jeez, what a dump. I said to myself as I walked. In all honesty, it was. It looked like all the gang violence, blast damage from the war, and constant weathering of the rain really took a toll on the old city. I could see an old stadium protruding from the skyline, and there were still old ads on it that read, Winnapolis is our turf, don't mess with the wolves, which must have been some leftover sports propaganda. What was worse was the smell in the air from the nearby river. It smelled like straight-up sewage. It was probably heavily polluted, like most of the water in the wasteland, but with the added disgustingness of mill gunk. There was other things that caught my eye in the city that weren't so bad. Down the river, I could see a variety of designed roads and hoof bridges. This made me realize that the city probably used to be a beautiful, bustling place before it was annihilated by war and what it wrought. As I came to the curve in the wall, I looked up at the guard pony on the top. It was hard to see since his post was so high up, but he appeared to not be looking in the direction I needed to go. So I made a run for the nearby road bridge while I could. As I broke into the gallop, I heard shots land near my rear hooves. I didn't return fire and risk getting more ponies involved. I was pretty sure he'd eventually give up and figure I was just another random wastelander. Unfortunately, he started to pursue me across the bridge that towered over the Grand P uh, Equestrian River. I took cover behind one of the pieces of concrete wall from the walking path alongside the road that had been knocked on its side years before. I pulled out Stardust's rifle and slipped into Sats, targeting three shots to his torso. They all bounced off his armor as he flew closer. Just let me pass. I'm no threat to you. I shouted up to him. You match the description of a wanted fugitive that's guilty of crimes against the Grand Pegasus Enclave. Surrender or be killed where you stand. He said as he aimed his rifle at me. I think this is a case of mistaken identity. You see, I am on my way to Mill City Tower to meet with Nightshade. If I'm not there in time and found dead, it'll be you who gets blamed for it. I suggest you let me pass and find out what it means to be fired by the Enclave. He lowered his gun a bit. If that's true, then who are you? Come on. Shit. Fuck. Come on, brain. Think of a believable lie. I'm Envy, you moron. Took the form of the courier to cause havoc around here and get ponies to not trust her. She's made quite the name for herself out in the West, but here she's no pony. Fine, then. Change back to your real form. He said condescendingly. I have to think of something fast if I was going to get out of this predicament. I have to think like envy. Cruel and insulting. Listen, you poor excuse for a worm. Do you know how hard it is for me to change forms? Not to mention that it was blow my cover to any pony who might be watching us right now. I can't believe they let an idiot like you in the Enclave. Maybe that's why they give you shitty guard duty. However, I guess I can shift into a dragon and bake you in your armor. It might blow my cover, but I could easily sniff out anyone close by and eliminate him. Alright, fine, you can pass. I don't feel like dying by the hooves of a sin anytime soon. Yes, it worked. I'm a fucking genius. Good. 
At least you're not as stupid as you look. I didn't know what he looks like, but it sounded like something Envy would say. I started walking across the bridge again as I flew back towards his post. Water from the river rushed under it as it clashed with rocks. Water misted my face. My pit buck clicked every time. I felt a sprinkle of the disgusting water touch me. But didn't want to walk any faster. Right now, things like radiation were the least of my worries. All I cared about was the exacting revenge for my dead friend and completely annihilating the Enclave in any way I could. Ahead of me was a treacherous place filled with violence, despair, gangs, and the smell of decay. But behind me wasn't much better. Somebody like me walking into Saint's Parish is surely a certain death. I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. This whole place was a living hell, and a river of death ran through it. As I approached the other end of the bridge, I saw a sign that read, Welcome to Annapolis. Under the name of the city, the word Murderapolis was spray-painted in red. I guess this place is pretty well known for something. I hope it's nice here, I said to myself sarcastically. Then a voice behind me said, You can't be serious. Annapolis is a hellhole. I turned to look at the floating robot. It's been a while, Watcher. Been busy. Or could you just not find me? Let's just say you're not the only pony to come out of a stable and cause havoc for others in the wasteland. He replied awkwardly. Where are your friends? I thought you always traveled with at least one of them. I gripped my teeth as I held back anger, but I answered him. Two of them are dead. One of them is brainwashed, and the others are probably hopelessly worrying about me back in the kingdom. I came here alone for vengeance. I want to kill the ones responsible for killing off my friends one by one. He sighed. Maybe I was wrong about you when we first met. But a few weeks ago, you looked so innocent and lost, and I wanted to help you find your way. I was proud when you saved those fools from the swarm of poisonous insects. But to see you now and hear that you seek vengeance is disappointing. I scoffed. Sorry I'm such a disappointment as someone who doesn't even come and talk to me face to face. What kind of coward hacks into robots to try and motivate ponies fresh out of stables anyway? The kind of coward who has something important to protect. Unlike you, I don't think about getting revenge for my dead friends. Not because I don't want revenge, but because it'd be useless. Things like that cause further misery and more destruction. Both self-destruction and physical destruction. Ponies or any other race that think of revenge is the answer are the reason the wasteland is as bad as it is. Radiation, taint, and mutated monsters are just icing on the cake. He replied sternly. I can't believe he just compared me to the fucking wasteland. So much another hole in the head for the world now? Is that it? Everyone I care about dies and I'm just supposed to blow it off like you to be considered morally acceptable? What kind of horrible fucked up logic is that? Huh? The reason... The reasonable kind that keeps ponies safe and sane, he said solemnly. A long time ago, six of my best friends died, one of whom I loved dearly, and another who was like a mother to me. For the longest time, I sought to revenge them, avenge their deaths by killing the parties responsible. But after taking count of lives, I realized it was in vain. No amount of killing would bring my friends back. I'm such a bitch. I didn't even think about him losing any pony in the past. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that you're not the only pony to lose something. He interrupted. Yeah, I guess you could say that. I was just so frustrated I didn't even think about what you must have lost over the years out here. I was never cut out to be what I am. All I'm ever good at was being a depressed orphan filly who couldn't stand up for herself in front of authority. I replied. Yeah. I heard about Stable 28. Quite a bloodbath. Sometimes, something about it makes me think that it's part of why you're taking this path. The way ponies are talking about how you cast out the former Overmare and watched her get eaten by ghouls. and didn't even put her out of her misery, he said flatly as the robot bobbed up and down. She got what she deserved. Ponies like her needed to be cleansed from the world. The world's gotten rotten, and it brings death and misery to the dwellers that live in it. Death's the only rifle punishment for anyone who kills whether it's for caps, hunger, murder, or, or personal gain. I said in the most serious tone I could without yelling at his mental face. He sighed again. By that logic, you're no better than them. 
How many ponies did you kill, and for what reason? I froze at that. Did Watcher somehow find out about my clash with pride and the innocent ponies of Appleton? What do you mean, Watcher? Why did you say it like that? The Sprite Bot Watcher was using to communicate with bobbed up and down before he answered. I hope someday you'll see that the path you've chosen is the wrong one. But for now, you're blinded with rage like I used to be. Open your eyes and take a look at yourself. Then tell me that you're not becoming the thing that you want to destroy. I will never be a senseless murderer like the rest of the wasteland, I yelled. I can hear a chuckle come from him through a sounded little tinny. We'll see. Shadow, if you continue to... He started to say before jaunty tunes came out of the sprite bot again. Always conveniently getting cut off, aren't you, Watcher? I said quietly to myself as I turned around and kept walking towards my goal. The inner city was just as horrible as the outside. It looked dark, dank, and decrepit. I've already killed at least three groups of raiders and a small gathering of zebra gangsters who were effectively doing what I found out was called curb stomping, a random stallion. I wasn't able to save him because his head was essentially a pile of chunky brain matter and pieces of skull. I did have some ammunition I could use and a healing potion or two. I was finally starting to get warmer now. Either that, or I was getting used to the temperature. The faint light coming through the clouds cast shadows off the buildings, giving the illusion that it was still early morning. But it was now getting closer to noon. If I don't make it out of Mill City Tower in time, I might miss my opportunity to strike. I could see the massive spire in the distance towering over me like it was trying to intimidate me into turning around. As I looked at it, I thought about what Watcher had said. I tried putting his words out of my head, but they kept working, worming their way back in, making me overthink what I was to come. Back in Scorchville, the robot serendipity said I was going to do something catastrophically deadly, and now Watcher was saying I'm headed down a path of evil like what I sought to destroy. Could they be right? Am I turning into a monster? In a way, I guess I am a monster. Aquila's sitting in the waiting for her moment to break through the barrier again and kill every pony in sight. Is that what Serendipity was talking about when she said I was going to do something horrible in Winopolis? Is she finally going to take over for good, or is it that I'm about to do is a bad thing? Finding my own thoughts isn't getting me anywhere. All it's doing was giving me cold hooves about going to Mill City Tower and confusing me to no end. If I do what I plan on doing, it means completely giving up on my old best friend. It also means virtually hunting the Enclave. I know I've already said that there's no saving Stardust, but somewhere deep down is telling me that I should still try to save him if I can. The thing that bothers me about this, though, is that I have no idea how to get him to that stupid memory machine in Stable 97 without dying in the process, or killing him by accident when trying to incapacitate him. I should have brought somebody with me instead of running off my own. I can guarantee they think that I'm either dead or doing something stupid. I'll go with the latter. Stupid's what I'm good at. Why stop now? Hey, yo, Philly. You're looking a bit lost. Anything I can do to help? A pony? No, wait, a, a zebra? Asked from behind me? His voice was strange. He didn't have the normal accent most zebra ponies have I've met. Why should I trust you? With my luck, you'll be sure to lower me back to some friends of yours so you can make a game out of killing me. Trying to hurt me is something I'm going to advise you against doing. It'll end badly for you and your friends. I replied. He smiled like I wasn't serious. Nah, nothing like that. I ain't one of those marks, thinking I'm some sort of badass because I'm in a gang. I did live around here with my mama, and I saw you when I was scavenging for some things. Name's Khalid. What's yours? I thought about my answer for a second. He seemed pretty innocent. The ponies like Envy had deceived me before. Shadow Star's my name. I'm a courier delivering a package to Mill City Tower. He laughed again. <laughs> yeah, sure you are. Ain't no pony go to Mill City Tower for nothing like that. Only reason ponies or some zebras like yours truly go there is to try something stupid, like busting a cap in a few of the Monclave motherfuckers. I'll tell you right now, it's suicide trying to do that. But I ain't gonna stop you. Suicide's your choice. Something about it reminded me of Stardust before it got taken. Maybe it's the way he referred to himself as yours truly. You're a perceptive one. Yeah, I'm gonna try my hoof at assassinating Nightshade and possibly Pride of the Seven Sins. 
The only difference between me and the other ponies who've tried doing it, is something equally as dumb, is I'm known for being heroic out west. They call me the courier where I'm from, and apparently a good guy in the eyes of the citizens of the Marave Wasteland. You gotta be shitting with me now. You're the courier? Tiny little bitch like you? I must be tripping or something to hear this shit. He said as he dramatically grabbed both sides of his head with his hooves. I sighed. Yes, I'm the courier. So what? He stopped what he was doing and replied, I never heard of your tiny ass. My jaw dropped straight to the ground. You've never heard of me. Then what was all that just now? He smiled. I was just messing with you, that's all. In a place like this, it's hard to get a laugh every once in a while because everyone's so damn depressed and wanting to cap each other or something, like over turf. Tell you what, since you're apparently some great heroine, and I'll help you get to Mill City Tower. What's the catch? I asked. He sighed and shook his head. I don't know, it might be asking too much. I gave him an annoyed look and said, just spit it out. He sighed again. Could you help me and my mama get to the kingdom? I can handle myself just fine in the waste, but my mama ain't like me. She don't have the confidence to jump on out of here and risk upsetting our local gang leader. She is also not much use when it comes to little old clap clap, neither if you know what I mean. She couldn't smoke the broadside of a barn with a gat if she tried. I gapped after him like I was an idiot. What? Clap clap? Smoke a barn? Gat? I... I don't follow. He shook his head. She ain't one for conflict and can't shoot shit if she tried. Now are you gonna help me or what? Sure. I'll see what I can do about getting you and your mother to the kingdom. That's if I survive what happens at Mill City Tower in the next few hours. I replied. Thinking that if anything, I most likely would just find a cadaver or a caravaner to have them ride outside of the city. He rushed over and hugged me. Thank you so much. I can't wait to tell my mama we're going to the kingdom and getting out of this here shithole. I gingerly pushed him away as to not offend him. You said you could hold your own in a fight. How good? He had a weird aw shucks look on his face, and honestly, it didn't suit a zebra such as himself. It looked weird. Then his demeanor totally changed to a false tough guy exterior. Killing bad guys. It'd be my business. My business. I'd be fucking cracking. It was one of those moments where my mouth moved before my brain could tell it what to say. So are you a bounty hunter or a mercenary or what? His reaction was priceless. What? Nah, ain't nothing like that. I just know how to not get shot when the bullets fly. I had to learn how on accident to the old G's, recruiting old zebras such as myself. If you refuse to join the gang, then you're likely to kill yourself instead. As a matter of fact, I know where the area they operate is, so we can go on a bit of a detour on the way you're heading. Detour? I asked. You know, going around the gang infested areas so we can avoid getting into skirmish with them? The way you're going spells all kind of trouble for you. You probably would have rocked right into their territory and gotten capped because yeah, they don't like ponies very much. They especially hate them enclave assholes because they're trying to run themselves out of their turf. He replied as he started leading me on towards the tower. Oh, I get it now. I'm glad I crossed paths with you, Khalid. I probably would have been late for my quote-unquote delivery, I said. <laughs> he smiled. Yeah, you're delivering something all right. Measure to those motherfuckers in the sky. They ain't gonna just push us around like little bitches and expect us to follow their rules. No offense about the little thing. I ain't making fun of your high digital figure speech is all. Northern Wastelanders and their figures of speech. It's fine. A good friend of mine used to call me all sorts of names regarding my height. I'm used to things like that. In fact, I miss being called Shrimp and Half Pint by two of my friends. Miss, they go somewhere? He asked. Sort of. One passed away last night. The other is out of his mind. I replied somberly. He looked shocked. What? Last night? Yeah. My other friend, he fatally injured her in battle, and she died without knowing much how I cared about her. I said, holding back tears. He looked away. 
That's some fucked up shit right there. This other friend of yours must be seriously whacked if he'd go and do something like that. Reminds me what happened to my father. See, when I was really young, the gang that controls the area we live in now was just gaining territory here. They tried recruiting him and his best friend Karim, but he said no. And one day, Karim comes to my home with my dad on his back and saying he was murdered by the OGs for refusing him. Later, I found out that Karim had killed him in initiation of the gang. First, he comes on so strong, that's about how much he loves his mom. Now he's telling me this. Damn, he's pulling on my heartstrings hard. I wanted to give him a hug so bad. That's the saddest thing I've ever heard. How could he kill his own best friend like that? He sighed and looked down at his hooves as he walked. I don't know. But he didn't last much longer after that. One of the other gangs set up a meeting with a couple of the OGs to discuss their terms or some shit like that. It ended up being a trap. They set up a fragile boards to the top of the hole filled with taint and covered with dirt. When they all came for the meeting gathering the area, the boards broke and they all fell in. Motherfucker deserved worse for what he did. At least he got what was coming to him in the end. I said, trying to lift his spirits a little. He looked straight ahead as he said, Yeah, but I wish I could have capped the motherfucker myself. I guess it's all for the best that he went out the way he did, though, instead of me doing it at only 12 years old. I would have done the deed. I'm sure I would have turned out a lot worse. That got me thinking again about my situation. I needed a distraction. OG, what is that? You keep mentioning them and I have no idea what they are. Yeah, they're called original gangsters. They're the members of the gang from when it was founded or something like that. I'm never really sure myself because I don't roll with any gangs. All I know is they've eh, quite a bit of control in the gang. He explained. Oh, that makes sense, I guess. Why didn't you ever join a gang? He gave me a fussy, funny look. The violence in the city is what keeps further destroying it. I don't want to be a part of that. Plus, there's the fact that it'd kill my mama if I joined a gang, and I love my mama. I don't want to disappoint her like that. I wish it was the same with my mother. She's like my friend. She doesn't even remember that I'm her daughter. The worst part is that she's tried to kill me, or have me killed, on multiple occasions. And I remember how sweet she used to be when I was a filly, before she left me in that stable. Shit, I'm sorry to hear that. I don't know what I'd do if my mom ever did something like that. Also, did you say you were in a stable? He says we both climbed over a large piece of concrete that must have fallen off a building ages ago. Shit. I didn't want to say anything too personal about myself like that. Um, yeah. I grew up in a stable out west. My mother left when I was young to go on some important mission or something. Something I think that she still hasn't accomplished. Damn. That sucks and all, but I seriously wish I could get my mama to leave our shitty apartment at least every once in a while. Her excuse is that she don't think it's safe to step hoof outside the door because of what happened to my father. I'ma get you real with you. I think she's too scared and would rather hide in that musty ass place until she dies. Anyway, what happened to your father? He wasn't around or some shit? He died when I was a fool, according to my aunt, that raised me after my mom left. They were both involved in some different factions in the past. At least she was. I don't know about my father. In reality, though, I think that's the thing that got him killed in the end. I replied, still trying not to give too much information. I still didn't know Khalid that well, and if this was really some calculated trap, too much detail might make things worse. He nodded his head. I see. You were even younger than I was when you lost your father. It's got to be pretty hard. I at least got to know my father before he died, but you didn't even get the chance I did before he was taken from you. What was your father like? I asked. He was one of the good ones, he replied solemnly. He was never the type to get involved with any of the gangs or nothing like that. He was a tribal zebra with a thick accent. He only wanted to help ponies and other zebras in need. In a way, I'm just like him. I don't roll with the gangs because it's stupid and pointless. I want to try to help everyone I can. Hearing you, what you just told me about him, you're pretty closely matched. Thank you for helping me, by the way. He smiled and waved his hoof. Shit, ain't no skin off my hide. As we walked, I looked up at the skyline and noticed Mill City Tower had gotten a lot closer. It looks like letting him help me was a good idea in the long run. I didn't have to keep stopping to shoot random raiders or gangers and didn't get turned around. Which, and I wasn't getting constantly lost. If he didn't have his mother to worry about, I might ask if he wanted to join our travels. But in the end, he ended up giving 
end up like some of the others who have traveled with me. Do you plan on anything once you and your mom get at the kingdom? I asked nonchalantly. He shook his head and replied, I ain't got no idea what I'm going to do besides get there for my mom. I suppose I could figure something out. Nancy, said they got a job system there. Yeah, they have... Shh! Go out for a sec. You hear that? He interrupted. I shook my head quietly. No. We're being watched. Some punk-ass little bitch probably thinks they can get the drop on us. Get ready. I'm gonna do something that might be a little stupid, but I'm gonna need some help. He whispered as he pulled out a small submachine gun. What do you want me to do? I asked. I'm gonna shoot at him and draw him to my tail. When I do that, they'll try and take me down. Make themselves known. Drop the ass. He answered quietly. Got it. I said as he slowly snuck around to get a better angle of the opposing party. He shot towards where he thought the sound was coming from, and an earth pony stallion popped out and returned fire. I grabbed Stardust's rifle off my back and took aim. He was moving around so much that it was hard to get a clear shot on him. Then he started focusing fire on me. I quickly ran to find cover behind a wall of a building and slipped into sats, taking aim at three shots at his head. Two of them missed, and the third one pierced through his left ear. I was about to slip into sats again, when Khalid ran across the street, firing a barrage of bullets with his SMG, sending the offender straight to the ground. As soon as he fell, Khalid and I ran over to him, Khalid kicking his pistol away from him. Is it dead? Khalid asked. Not a chance in hell, the stallion said weakly. I pointed the rifle at his head and fired. He is now. Damn, that's cold. How oh, if I never get on your bad side? You one crazy little bitch, ain't you? He said. I nodded. Yeah, points like the Sins will do that to you when you're constantly trying to kill them and your friends in any way they can. Mill City Tower ain't too far from here, so there ain't much further to go. We shouldn't run into much more bitch-ass mocks like him anytime soon. Let's count the Enclave, he said. I think I can take it from here. You don't have to take me the rest of the way. He cocked his head. You sure about that? I really don't mind taking you there. I nodded again. Yeah, I'm sure. Don't worry, I'll keep my promise and help you and your mom. Just give me the location of where you live and I'll go there once I'm done. He paused for a moment, walked over to me. He grabbed my pit buck and entered some coordinates in his home. And a marker popped up my EFS. I guess I'll see you soon then if you ain't dead after this. Just be careful. I will be. The Enclave hasn't managed to kill me yet. It was nice to meet you, Khalid. I hope you, we can get you and your mom to the kingdom after this. As he walked away, I noticed the confidence with each step. It reminded me of how Stardust used to walk. When he was gone, I continued on towards Mill City Tower, which was so close now that it actually hurt my neck to look up at the top of it. When I walked around one of the fallen buildings, I saw the base of the tower. From what I could tell, it was only one entrance to the tower itself and it was guarded by at least ten pegasi in power armor, two of which stood by the door. The rest were patrolling the area, either on hoof or in the air around the entrance. When I looked up again, I saw a lot more pegasi flying around the tower, going up as high as I could see. The radio ponies weren't kidding when they had said the guard was on the Mill City Tower was ramped up. Nightshade must be a really big deal, or one of the ponies with him was. I still couldn't get out of my head that he was the pony that wanted to help me but he still used Stardust to hunt me down. Why did he want to find me so bad? At least, he did years ago? Something more was going on, and I intended to find out what it was. The only problem now was that I was going to get into the tower itself. Once I did, how was I going to get around without being spotted? I really wish I had a zebra stealth cloak right now. If I could get some of what the guards to leave the door right now, I might be able to slip inside and figure it out from there. The question was, how was I going to do that? Then I noticed one of the guards putting a hoof to his helmet to say something. I couldn't make out what he was saying, but I had a feeling I knew what he was doing. Their power armor must have some kind of radio inside them. If so, I brought up the broadcaster on the Mark II and started to search through the channels. It didn't take long to find one that was up. It was listed as MCTEB87. With a smile, I flipped it on and waited. A moment later, a mare's voice echoed through my pit buck. Enter patrol, we have heard gunshots close to the tower. Report. A stallion's voice echoed out next to it. We heard it too. Most likely more gangs trying to kill each other out there. 
Not to worry. There's more than enough firepower to keep them away. Be sure that you do. We don't need any problems today. Counselor Pony Nightshade and three High Counselor members with him just arrived. I don't want them to think that we can't keep back the low-life gangbangers that live around here, the mayor said. As they talked, a plan started to form in my head as I grinned. Going back to the broadcaster, I flipped on the mic. Doing my best to sound like Milkshake, I said into it. This is Patrol from Saints Parish. Does any pony from Mill City Tower read me? I looked up and saw one of the ponies near the door stop and put his hoof to his helmet. His voice echoed out of my pit buck a moment later. This is the ground patrol from Mitisilla Tower. Why are you contacting us? Clearing my throat, I said in my altered voice again. We spotted a small mare that matched the description of the courier from New Pegasus trying to sneak into Annapolis. We tried to stop her, but she attacked us, killing three of our guards. And why are you bothering us with this information? Get more guards from your own city to go after her, the stallion said. We would, but she escaped into Annapolis. She was headed towards the tower when we last spotted her. There are signs that she's killed a few ponies and zebras along the way. The trail of bodies leads in your direction. Fuck, you gotta be kidding me. We can't deal with her right now. The council ponies just arrived. Can't your team search her down? He yelled into his own mic. We would, but it's only me and my partner left. We don't know this city as well as you do. I paused for dramatic effect. We're almost at the tower now. Wait a moment. I think we spotted her. I saw the ponies around the entryway tense up as the stallion said, What's your location? I grinned as I walked back a couple of blocks and said to the broadcaster, It's her! We're going to engage! No, don't! The stallion said, but not fast enough. I pulled out Dreamwalker and my plasma rifle. I fired a few shots in the air with both weapons. When that was finished, I screamed to the broadcaster, Help me! Please help! She's going to kill us! Send as many ponies as you can! She's not alone! I cut out what I was going to say, firing more shots in the air. When it was finished, I said in my own voice, keeping the Mark II away from it so it sounded distant. Tell me where to find Nightshade and Pride. Shading my voice and bringing up the Mark II closer again. Please, I don't know where he is. Don't kill me, please. I have a family. I pulled the Mark II back again and said in my own voice. So did I. I fired off one more round, cut the mic, and walked back to where I could see the tower again, listening to the broadcaster to see if my ruse had worked. Sure enough, as I rounded the corner, I watched from the shadows. I saw the Pegasi forming a group, getting ready to fly off to where they fired the rounds at. The mayor's voice from before came back over the broadcaster. Captain, what was all that? The stallion said, We think the courier killed some patrols from the wall. It seems like she took out the rest a few blocks away from here. Go check it out. If it is the courier, be sure to radio in. Pride's here right now, and we can send him in to take care of her. The stallion laughed. I'm sure we can take care of one mare, even if she is with her friends. Don't underestimate her, Captain. Other ponies have done so before, and they did not live long because of it. If you find her, you let me know. That is in order. Yes, ma'am, he said. I watched as most of the guards around the tower's base flew off towards where I'd been shooting. They only left two ponies behind, both of them flying around looking for any sign of, well, me, coming to try and get into the tower. Two I could handle. At this point, I was sure all the wasteland ponies were born morons. I pulled out my plasma rifle again and took aim with sats, and fired three rounds at both as they flew closer to the ground. Luckily for me, the first one wasn't wearing a helmet. His muzzle and mane were showing, and two of my shots slammed into his exposed face. He went down without making a sound, his body glowing as it melted into green glue. The second I hit with his exposed wing. He screamed as he fell to the ground with a loud crash from his armor scraping against the asphalt. I ran out of cover, switching out the rifle for the oddly shaped blade I found in the absent ruins. He was writhing on the ground, his wing mangled from the shots I took. He looked at me as I approached. No! How did you- I stabbed him in the visor. The blade sliding into his skull like the armor he was wearing was nothing more than paper. He twitched, then went limp as I twisted the blade around in his brain pan. With that done, I looked back to make sure no pony had heard the noise. Then I lifted the body with my magic and walked over to where I was hiding and hid the body in a pile of trash. 
I went back into the same thing with the pile of goo, which was all that remained of the other Pegasus. It was harder to hide, what I had done with him, but I hoped the small specks of glowing green would go unnoticed when the guards got back. I couldn't have any pony locking down the tower before I found my target. When that was done, I turned towards the doors that led into Mill City Tower and walked up to them. Opening them slowly, I looked around to make sure the guards weren't posted inside. To my relief, no pony was in the large room beyond the doors. I quickly moved in, shutting the doors behind me. I took a deep breath, then made my way over to the long reception desk that stood at the far end of the room, hoping I'd be able to find something on there that would help me find where I needed to go, or a way to get around this place unnoticed. Either way, I was finally inside the tower. There was no going back now. The desk was mostly empty, apart from a few pre-war papers scattered around. One of the terminals was giving off a soft glow. Moving over to it, I used the Mark II to get me past the need for a password. I was expecting the same jumble of numbers and letters to come up like always, but it didn't. The Mark II came up with a message. Pipluck Mark II SB. Opening advanced hacking software. New terminal found. Protection on terminal has medium level security. Attempting to bypass security now. Security bypassed. Unlocking Mill City Tower Operations Terminal. I watched the screen went blank on the terminal for a moment, then came back up with a dozen files on it. I scanned over them quickly and right away noticed that most of the files on it had to do with the layout of the building. Better yet, one of the files told me was on each level. To top it off, the files were newer. They've all been updated the past week, so the Enclave was still using the terminal for themselves. Perfect. I downloaded the files into my pip book and started to check one of the most recent files. Thunder Whip. Council Pony Nightshade will be here tomorrow. One of the Sins came by today to tell us that we needed to make sure one of the meeting rooms was ready for him and three High Counselor ponies to accompany him. Pride said to also have a room ready for Nightshade, too, because he most likely will be staying with us for a few days here in the tower. The High Council ponies will only be here for the meeting and will be heading back to Stratus after. I'm not sure what Nightshade wants with us, or why he will be staying afterwards. I don't like this one bit. Something's going on here, and it stinks. From what I know of him, he doesn't trust the Sins. Who would? Why is he bringing the new pride with him, then, and sending us messages like this? Something's wrong. We need to figure out what's really going on. Either way, make sure to do what they want for now. Make sure you do something about those files we talked about before from Dr. Stormy. They might be here to check on how things are going with the Twin Cities, but they don't need to know everything we're doing. Put them in the safe in my room. Not the normal one, the one I keep behind my portrait of my wife. Snowdrift. So, you're here now. Good to know. Now, where are they staying? I said as I looked at more files. Then I saw a response to the first one. Snowdrift. I've already done what you asked. I figured you'd want some things they are hidden away before they arrived. After what Nightshade will be staying, I've set up a meeting room on 45 for them. I've also readied the suite on 48 for Nightshade and Pride. Need anything else, just let me know. Thunder Whip. I smiled wider, then looked at the diorama of Mill City Tower. From what I could tell, there were 57 floors. Nightshade and Stardust must be at the top, towards the top. According to the diagram, the first 15 floors were mostly empty. The next few levels served as an area for the soldiers and guards that patrolled the Twin Cities to rest and store personal items. There were also a few levels dedicated to research from what I could tell. They took up floors 36 through 42. The rest of the floors beyond were research area to the place where Nightshade was going to be holding the meeting were empty too. If they have research area here, they most likely have unicorns there. I might be able to disguise myself as one of the research ponies. I'd have to find a way to get up there, I said, looking around. On one side of the lobby, I could see elevators. With my luck, they wouldn't work, or go the right way, past the guard rooms. I guess it didn't matter. I'd have to try something. Sooner or later, someone was going to come in here and find me. I couldn't risk that. So I walked over the elevators and clicked the call button. A moment later, one of them opened up with a soft ding. Walking in, I pushed the button for floor 35, figuring it could bring me up to an empty floor that I could use to reach the research levels. The door shut, and the elevator shot upward. I watched the numbers flew by on the small dial above the doors. The sudden movement and high speed made my stomach feel like some pony was pushing on it through my back. 
I may feel ill. Soon it stopped on 35. The doors opened again, revealing a dark, empty room beyond and a glowing barrier right at the doorway. As the door opened, a sweet-sounding mayor's voice said, Twin Cities Control Hub. Great. I should have known there'd be something blocking my way. I yelled, kicking the transparent pink barrier. I was expecting my hoof to bounce off the glowing wall, but it went right through. The momentum from the kick threw me off balance, and I rolled through the barrier onto the dusty room. The elevator door closed behind me, leaving me in almost complete darkness. I got back to my hooves and looked around. Then I looked over at the wall, at the door that was still blocked by pink energy. How did I get through that? I walked back over to it and poked at the barrier. My hoof went through it and touched the doors on the other side. Huh. If what the stranger said was right about these kinds of barriers, I must have an ancestor that's programmed into the spell. For once, the goddesses were on my side. If I get through barriers like that, if there were more, then they wouldn't be a problem for me in the future. Good to know. Now to see what the floor had to offer. I turned back towards the dark, dusty room, trying to figure out what it was used for. It was a large space, with only a couple separate rooms on each side. The rest of the space was filled with terminals, desks, maps, tech that I didn't recognize, and one large-ass screen right in the middle of the room. The walls were tinted glass from that went from floor to ceiling. Walking over to one, I could see most of Annapolis and a good amount of Saints Parish right across the river. I started to walk around the edge of the room, looking out to see what else I could see. When I got to the north side, I stopped and squinted. On the horizon, I could just make out a small horizontal beam of light reaching towards the sky. I wonder what that is. I said to myself as I pulled out my binoculars and tried to see if that would help, but it didn't. Whatever that light was, it was miles away from the Twin Cities. Maybe it's where the Crystal Empire is. I know that's north of here. I doubt it's close enough to see from here, though. Figuring it didn't matter, I went back to looking around the room. Most of the terminals here were either powered down, broken, or smashed. One, however, had the telltale green glow of a working terminal. I walked over to it. I tried to log on, but it was locked. Oh well, maybe the Mark II could pull off its new trick again. When I hooked up the Mark II, it didn't just unlock the screen, like it did down at the lobby, so I had to resort to the harder way of hacking. The words came up on the screen with a jumble of letters and numbers, as always. With six tries and some muttered curses, I finally got the password. It was observation. The screen came up with a little over a half dozen files and the title, The Twin Cities Municipal Control System. What the hell is a municipal control system? I read the files that were listed below, and it became clear right away. Street Cam Data, Saints Parish District 1 through 4. Street Cam Data, Saints Parish Districts 5 through 8. Street Cam Data, Minneapolis Districts 1 through 6. Street Cam Data, Minneapolis Districts 7 through 10. Radio Signal Detections, Traffic Control Center, MAS Emergency Broadcast System Control Center. Was this room used to spy on what was going on around the Twin Cities? I asked myself as I clicked one of the files under Winnapolis District 1 through 5. Another file came up that I could choose, a district itself. Clicking on number 1, I saw more files come up for the camera had access to. The first one brought up some sort of blanks with an error message. Same for the next one and the next one, and so on. Not surprising, most of the city is destroyed, so I'm sure the cameras are too. I went back and chose one of St. Parrish's. When I chose a camera, the large screen in the middle of the room lit up, and I saw one of the streets of St. Parrish. Ponies of all kind were walking down the street, talking with each other or shopping at some vendors. I chose another and got much the same thing. Only this time I saw a griffin talking with three stallions and taking notes on a pad she was holding in one talon. A griffin in St. Parrish. I wonder if that's Kitty. Unless there are more griffins in the city, but I doubt that. She looked a little older than Aura. She also looked a little kinder. Aura always had this hard-edged guard to her. And this griffin looked happy. Whenever she was saying to the stallions must have been funny because she kept laughing when they responded to her questions. I found myself watching her for the longest time, forgetting for the moment that I was in Enclave territory. As I watched, I found my imagination taking over and I swore I could almost hear Aura talking to me, as if the griffin magically appeared next to me. Hey, shrimp. Why don't you take a picture? It'll last longer. I heard the disembodied Voss say. 
Why do that when it's more fun to watch her in the moment? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, she's cute and all, but I doubt she could handle herself in a fight. Unless that's the kind of griffin you like. Pretty, but useless. Nah, there's only one griffin for me, Aura. She might be cute, but she's not you. I said. My eyes still watching the griffin on the screen as she waved goodbye to the stallions and moved on to chat with the mayor who was working a fruit stand. She should have told me that before it was too late, she said. As she said that, I swore I could feel her presence. My eyes went wide and I twisted around. Aura? There was no one there. Fresh tears rolled down my face as I looked in the empty room. Aura's non-existent words hanging over me like a dual ghost. Sorry I couldn't save you. I wiped my eyes and turned back to the terminal and the large screen. The griffin was gone, so I backed out inside. I was just wasting time now, letting my curiosity get the better of me. I didn't need distractions right now. I needed to get past the next few floors so I could find Stardust and Nightshade. The data from this terminal could be helpful later, though. So I hooked the Mark II up to it and transferred the data. It might not hook me up to the cameras around the city, but I might as well have the rest. I walked away from the terminal and started looking away for a way to reach the next level. If I couldn't find stairs, then I could always risk taking the elevator up the rest of the way. But I hoped it didn't come to that. I didn't want to reach the floor I needed only to run into more guards. Fortunately for me, I knew too well that most of the Enclave, by now, they'd know who I was right away. I needed to find a disguise or a way to get around any security I ran into. On one of the ends of the rooms, there was a door, and I finally found a staircase. Finally, something! It was also blocked by a barrier, just like the elevator. But like before, I was able to go right through it. Pulling out Dreamwalker, I slowly made my way up the stairs. When I reached floor 36, I tested the door and found it was unlocked. So surprised. I whispered myself sarcastically as I pulled out my bobby pins. A few seconds later, the lock clicked and I slowly opened the door. This floor was way different than the ones I'd been just on. A long hallway with doors on each side was in front of me, with a much bigger room at the end that opened up with a fill of cubicles and terminals. I could see a couple of ponies typing away on them, busy with whatever job they were doing in the building. Moving slowly into the hall, I started looking at the doors. They were on each side. Two were bathrooms, one were locker rooms, and there was some more. There was a closet to me that said it was Dr. Stormy's office. It... I made my way to that one and slowly opened the door. No pony was inside, so I slipped in quietly. There was a desk with a terminal, charts on the wall, recordings scattered on the desk mixed with paperwork, a pair of glasses, and a view overlooking the city behind the desk. When I looked to one side, I saw that his office also had its own private bathroom. I went over to it and walked in, closing the door behind me. This Dr. Stormy had a locker, a private shower, and everything else you'd expect in a bathroom. Opening the locker, I found a white lab coat, with a few odds and ends. As I looked through the bathroom, I still trying to think of a way I could get further up the tower, I heard the door of the office open, followed by a mayor's voice. I don't care what Snowdrift says. He can wait till later for the reports. I have to get ready for the meeting. The mayor said, sounding irritated. A stallion's voice followed her into the room. I understand, Dr. Stormy. But he said he wanted the reports before the meeting starts. The mayor sighed as she responded. He just wants them so we can take out the things he doesn't want the council to know about. I don't care. As you know, I'm the one who requested this meeting, and it took me three months to convince Nightshade to come. I'm not going to let Snowdrift get away with hiding my research just so he can stay out of trouble. If he doesn't like it, then he can come down here and request the information himself, even if the answer he gets will still be no. I heard hoofsteps getting close to the bathroom door. Panicking, I jumped into the locker, closing it behind me and looking out of the slits to watch what was going on, hoping the mayor wouldn't open it. The mayor that walked in was wearing a white lab coat, just like the one in the locker. She also could have passed for my twin. Well, maybe not a twin, but her coat was a darker gray close to my black one. Her mane was a light gray, almost white, and I couldn't see her eyes because she was wearing dark goggles. She was also a unicorn, and almost as short as me, but her mane was shorter and more practical than my own. A taller blue pegasus stallion was right behind her. 
I understand that, but you know what I will happen if I go back up, him telling him you said no. He'll just send me right back down again. She rounded on him, poking his hoof into his chest. I don't care. I go away. I need to get ready. The meeting's going to start any minute, and I don't have any time to waste. But... Did I stutter? Now leave! She yelled, her horn glowing with an orange light. No, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. He said, taking a hasty retreat. Vile, incompetent worm. The unicorn said, turning back to look at herself in the mirror. One of these days, I'm going up to that prick's office to show him who really runs things around here. As I watched the mayor fix up her mane, an idea came to mind, and I smiled. Slowly, drawing Dreamwalker, I opened up the locker, pressed the barrel to the back of her head. Don't move. She sighed and just kept working on her mane. Really? Don't move? Is this the best threat you can come up with? Frowning, I pressed the barrel against the back of her head. If you don't do what I tell you to... She interrupted. Let me guess. You'll kill me? How boring and predictable. You do realize I have a pistol pressed against the back of your head? Right? A pistol? She said, sounding more offended than shocked as she glanced at me through the mirror. Ignorant child. That isn't your normal run-of-the-mill pistol. That's a Luna Edition Desert Eagle. It was one of the most beautiful and deadly weapons developed by Iron Shard Firearms. They only made ten of those, nine of which were given to special soldiers during the war, and all of which have either been destroyed or are in the care of the Enclave officers. The tenth and last one was given to the mayor named Babseed, and we thought it was lost. Which it looks like it wasn't, since you have it now pointed to the back of my head. If you want to threaten me, then at least give me some respect to the weapon that you're holding. What does any of that matter? Stop working on your mane! I yelled as I pulled back the hammer. Oh, I can't do that. I'm too busy to deal with you and get ready for the appointment of the council. If you really want something, then spit it out and be gone. Was this mare for real? I shook my head. Do you even care if I kill you? Oh, I do care quite a bit. You see, I'm just a little too busy to die. There's so much that should be done and not enough time to do it. But if you really feel like you need to... F Feed your bloodthirst by painting the wall red with the contents of my skull. Feel free to pull the trigger. But I warn you now, as soon as you do, you'll regret it. Why's that? She sighed again, as she slowly turned to look at me, still ignoring Dreamwalker, which is now pressed back between her eyes. First of all, you won't be able to pull the trigger before I can teleport out of the way. Trust me. You would be the first pony to try killing me like this. Second, as soon as the magnificent piece of pony craftsmanship you call a pistol goes off, you'll have every able-bodied soldier on this floor to deal with. Now, why are you here wasting my very limited time? I cursed and pulled Dreamwalker back a little, but I still kept a train on her head. I need to find a way up to the meeting room. And your point is? I need to find Nightshade and Stardust. I'm going to kill him. One of her eyebrows went up a little. I really don't care if you want to kill Nightshade or the rest of the pompous pricks that run things around here. As for the pony you call Stardust, you must mean pride. You couldn't kill him even if he had an army at your side storming the tower. You must be the courier that the ponies and Stratus keep talking about. I take it that you're an overly enthusiastic opinion of yourself. Or at least your meager skills as a fighter. I really don't like you. I said, really wanted to just blow her brains out, but she did have a point. Dreamwalker would bring every pony in the tower running. No pony likes me, and I don't really care. I'm too busy with my work to care about ponies in the tower or the Enclave. But I can see in your face that you're really determined to kill Pride. So I'll do you a favor, and I'll help you stay alive. Now that was a surprise. What are you talking about? She sighed again. Right now, I only have about five minutes that I can spare. If you wouldn't mind, please stop pointing that at me, and I can show you what I mean. How do I know you're not going to try anything? I asked. Because I give you my word. My word is my bond. I live by that statement and always will. But if it makes you feel better, keep the pistol out. She replied. Growling, I holster Dreamwalker. Fine. But if you try anything, you'll regret it. Sighing deeper and longer... She turned back towards her office. I'm sure I will. Now follow me, courier. 
And by the way, my name's Dr. Stormy. What's yours, or do you prefer to be called Courier? I don't know how I feel about Dr. Stormy's change in character. So, with no other way to respond to her question, I just answered it following her. Shadow. Shadow Star. She moved behind her desk and started typing in the terminal. Shadow Star, huh? There's something familiar about that name, but I can't put my hoof on it. Figuring it couldn't hurt, I sat down next to her on the side of the desk. It's not my original name. My mother changed it when I got to the stable. I grew up in, eh, before that it was Morningstar. And any memory I have, I've been able to remember all my parents and family, so they just called me Star. She stopped talking and gave me a quizzical look. Just Star? Where were you from originally? Why do you care? Because I'm the kind of mare who likes to know things. Knowledge is the most important thing in the wasteland. Also, I think I know why you were called just Star. That is, if your parents did change it later in your life. Honestly, I can't remember anything about my past. My mother placed a very powerful memory spell on me when I first got to my stable. But from things I've learned since I've been out, with some memories I've gained, I think I was born in the Crystal Empire. She smiled a little. Ah, so my deduction was correct. Yeah, and? She tisked and went back to working on her terminal. I'm also from the Crystal Empire. My parents were farmers near the edge of the city. The ponies that live there have different customs than the rest of the wasteland. Naming their children is one of them. Like your star. If one of your parents was from the Crystal Empire, they would have named you with just a single name. Normally, it has something to do with they think you will be, or a family trait. It could also be something that one of them loves. As a child grows and their personality becomes more well-known, they will either change it or add to it. Or my mother was trying to hide me from the Enclave when she ran away. She shrugged. It is possible, but I don't think so. If she wanted to do that, she would have dropped the star in your name. But what do I know? As fascinating as this is, what did you want to show me about killing Stardust? She laughed. <laughs> Kill him. I never said that, Shadow. What I said is I'd show you how to stay alive. What I mean is, I'll show you why you shouldn't even try attacking him in any way. What the fuck? I'm not leaving this place unless I kill him and Nightshade. If you know what a weakness he has is, tell me. She finished what she was typing in, then moved aside to show me the screen. I give you the Devil's Children program. Pride, or as you call him, Stardust, was one of the only ones from Phase 1 to fully survive. I looked at the screen, showing diagrams and notes on the program. As I read, I asked, It says the program was meant for only one or two ponies to survive. I wouldn't say I wanted only one or two to survive. I only expected one or two to pass the tests, she said. But as you can see from my notes, Pride was trained to be the perfect soldier. He excels in just about everything from common weaponry to heavy weaponry, hoof to hoof, melee, and long-ranged weapons. He was also trained in espionage, camouflage, persuasion, and specialized battle tactics. He can think ten moves ahead of his opponents and figure out their weaknesses so he can use them against them. She sounded like a mother talking about her son and how proud he was of his accomplishments. All of it was making me shake with rage. You act like he is perfect. Correction, he is perfect. If he was so perfect, then why did he run away? I asked. That took the smile off her face. You do have a point. Before we got him back, he wasn't quite perfect. Not yet. I never meant for him to run away like he did. But that's what you get when you have ponies trained in espionage. Hailstorm was better at that than Pride. It was because of him that Pride escaped. Sadly, he died, so he could have been more useful. He was Stardust's best friend, I yelled. And stop calling him Pride. His name is Stardust. She frowned. Do keep your voice down. I'm right next to you, and I don't feel like listening to you bitch like a foal. I don't care who he used to be. He's pride now. Soon he'll make a new generation of sins for us. A team that is more under the command of the council. Once he does that, he'll be ready for phase two. Glaring at her, I asked, And what is phase two? She grinned at the question. We clone him, making more soldiers as perfect as he is. Soldiers that will never betray us. 
ones that can control and don't have to worry about falling in battle like we do now. When phase two is complete, we won't have any more use for pride. As she spoke, I pressed a button on my pit buck and asked, If that was the plan the whole time, then why did you take away his memories? Why make him do any of this if he was already perfect? Because we needed him to get stronger, to hone his skills more so that we can clone him. It will make it that much easier for us to make more just like him. He is perfect, but he's still not as strong as he can be. Though even if we didn't plan on him escaping Stable 97 like he did, it did work out in the long run. The seven months he spent in the Wasteland did more for him than another five years in training would have. We've had to modify his memories because Stardust was too cocky. He didn't take orders and he didn't like... He was... To put it lightly, an ass. We planned on doing this to him before he escaped, but... I'm glad we didn't until now. Making him think his worst enemy is you is perfect, she said with a laugh. So you changed his memories to make him think that I killed his best friend so you can control him? Is that what I'm hearing, Dr. Stormy? That's right. And now you should understand why you won't be able to kill him. He's hell-bent on killing you one day. He'll stop at nothing to blow your brains out. Once he finishes his mission for Nightshade, he'll finish you off. I smiled and pushed the button again on my pit buck. Good to know. And thank you for telling me all that, Doctor. She shrugged and closed the files on her terminal. Now, if you're smart, I'd suggest you leave. That is, if you want to live longer. If you want to go up to where the meeting is, you'll just end up dead. I pulled out Dreamwalker again and pointed it at her. No, I won't die. But I swear to goddesses, every last one of you Enclave bastards will. She just laughed, and her horn glowed. I don't think so. She just laughed, as she overpowered my telekinesis in the blink of an eye, ripping Dreamwalker out of my magical grip. And then, her horn glowed again, and I was slammed into the ground and held there. She got up from her seat and walked closer to me. Now, that was a stupid move, Shadow Star. Gave you a chance to leave, but you just had to get your revenge on us. Why is that? What could make you act like such an idiot? I was at the boiling point, my anger reaching its limits. Looking up into her goggles, I said, Stardust killed someone I love. He took her away from me, right after I finally realized how I felt about her. As I talked, I let my anger feel my power, letting it enhance my magic. I could feel the magic around my horn glow brighter than it ever had before. Dr. Stormy's smile fell, and she took a single step back. What are you? That deep voice I heard before spoke again as I started to prepare the spell. That's it, Star. This mare's the one who started the whole program that took your friend. Show her who you really are. With a simple flicker of my magic, I blew apart her spell holding me down. Getting back to my hooves, I said, I'm Shadow Star, an ordinary package courier, and the daughter of Grimoire Spell. She took another step back. Grimoire? No. That can't be possible. Her child is dead. I'm not dead, and I never was. But I'm not just the daughter of one of the most powerful unicorns to come from the Enclave. I'm also your worst nightmare. I don't care who you are, and you can't do anything to me in here. I already told you that you fire your gun. She never finished what she was going to say. Pulling the sword I found in my saddlebags, I brought it around and stabbed her in the chest. The blade just missing her heart. Blood gushed out of the wound as I pulled the blade free. Dr. Stormy, falling to the floor, whimpering in pain as she tried to stop the bleeding with her hooves. Holding the blade up, I looked down at her. The Enclave took everything from me. My father, my mother, my friends, my life. You should have just told me that you were the pony who started the program. That made Stardust. I might have let you live if you didn't. But now, you get to die. Just like the rest of the arrogant Enclave fucks in this place. She looked up at me, saying in a weak voice, What do you mean your father was taken? My father was a soldier. He died trying to find me. I might not have been on Enclave orders, but it might as well have been. Because the way you think ponies in the clouds have to live, he had to hunt down my mother, and ended up dead because of it, I said, readying the sword. Your father. You fool, he's... 
I jammed the sword into her throat, cutting off the last of her words. She gagged and tried to let out a scream, but the blade was blocking her airwave. She couldn't draw breath or let in air from her lungs. Her chest pumped, trying to force the air past the steel lodged in her, but to no avail. I reached down and pulled the goggles off, looking deep into her dark orange eyes. No more lies for you. No more words of who you think Stardust is. I hope you burn in hell, Enclave scum. I ripped the sword out of her, blood rushing out of the jagged hole, some of it splashing out of my mane and coat. But I didn't care. No Enclave fucks deserved to live. She tried to take in another deep breath. I could hear air flow through her neck. Only a moment before the blood fountaining from her neck flowed into her windpipe and into her lungs. She gagged again, her head failing forward. As I stood over her, I still looked into her eyes. She lifted a hoof to try to grab onto me, trying anything she could to get me to save her. I just pushed her hoof away and watched as the life drained from her eyes. I shook my head and checked her body for anything I could use. She didn't have much on her apart from a ID card. I walked back into the bathroom and took an extra outfit she had in the locker. I removed my barding, put it into my saddlebags, and dressed myself in the dead mare's extra outfit. Turning to look myself over in the mirror, one thing became obvious. I may look like her, but my mane would be a dead giveaway. I took up the sword and looked at its bloody length, then back to myself. With a sigh, I turned on the faucet, cleaned up the blood, and stuff off my face, and then went back to looking at myself. Sorry, Mom, but I can't say the mare you used to know and love. I can't keep holding on to the things that remind me of who I used to be. Using my magic, I pulled my braid out. I brought the sword closer, and with a quick slash, most of the lower part of my mane came free. Holding back a sob, I tossed my beautiful silver braid into the trash, then looked myself over it again. My mane now only came down past my shoulders. It was ragged and uneven. Looking around in the locker behind me, I found some scissors and started to fix what I could. It only took me a few minutes, and I knew I couldn't do as well as the pony like Sugarbuck could. But it did look better than it did. I also trimmed up my bangs. Then, using the red hairband I found in the locker, I pushed my mane back and used it to hold it there. When I looked back in the mirror, I didn't even recognize myself. I looked older and more confident. More importantly, in dim light, I could pass for the bitch I was pretending to be. I took the goggles she was wearing and put them on. Then cleared my throat in my best to sound like her. I'm Dr. Stormy. It was close, but not close enough. So I tried to remember how sarcastic she was. Who else would I be, you fool? Dr. Stormy, now leave me alone. I'm too busy to deal with a worm like you. I smiled. Much better. I looked myself over once more, then figured I couldn't do much better. I started to work on the next plat uh, problem, the Mark II. How was I going to hide it? I guess I could just try and cover it with a sleeve. I pushed the sleeve of the lab coat over the Mark II. At first, it didn't want to go over, but after some work, I got it. There was a small bulge, but hopefully no one would notice, or if they did, they wouldn't think too much about it. The last thing I needed to do was figure out what to do with Stardust's rifle. I couldn't just put it in my saddlebags. The bags were enchanted to hold more than they should, but unlike my plasma rifle, Stardust's rifle is longer. So far, I've always kept it on my back like he used to. Lifting the rifle, I looked it over. I couldn't get away with just carrying it around with me while I was dressed like I am. There was nothing else to do with it. I had to hide it, somewhere, and get it on my way out. Walking back over the door that led into the hallway, I opened it and looked around. Seeing no pony there, I trot back to the staircase and made my way back down to floor 35. Passing through the barrier again, I walked over to the large monitor in the middle of the- and hid my rifle under it. I really wanted to use it on Stardust. The thought of killing him with his own rifle was kind of poetic. I couldn't do that now, but I wouldn't just leave it behind. When he was gone, I'd come back and retrieve his rifle. It would serve as a reminder of the pony he used to be, and the friend that I lost. I'll be back for you, I said, turning my head back upstairs. I was just getting back to the office when two power armored pegasi came down the hall, one of them saying, Dr. Stormy, there you are. We were sent down here to get you. The meeting is about to start. I froze for a moment, then slipped into my new character. I let a long sigh, then adopted the voice of Dr. Stormy. I can tell time, you know. I was just about to head up there, and I don't remember asking for an escort. 
They both stopped, then the other pony, a mare from the sounds of the voice, said, Sorry, Dr. Stormy. Nightshade said we should come get ya. We were just following orders, ma'am. Does he think I'm a fool? Fine, whatever. Let's get on with it. I don't want to keep him waiting. I said, walking towards them, and away from the office, which still had the body of the real doctor in it. I had a lot of blood pool on the floor. The mare stopped, asking me, Don't you need your files? Looking up at her, I said, Do I tell you how to do your job when you're done, gone 36 hours without sleep and neck deep in stress surrounding your job? No. She scratched the back of her head. At least once or twice a day. Well, they're telling me how to do my job part anyway. That's besides the point. I don't need you telling me what I need and don't need for this meeting. The nerve of you idiots. Now, let's go before I report you for holding me up. They both saluted. Ma'am. They turned and I followed as they led me through the office, past Pegasi and a couple of unicorns who were working on terminals, and to a different elevator. I watched as the Pegasus used a key card on it, like the one I had taken off the unicorn to open the elevator. Then we all got in and started heading up. We arrived at floor 45. This floor was also different from the ones I was on before. There was a reception desk, like the one in the lobby, only smaller, with an old Pegasus mare looking at it. There were two seats on each side for ponies to wait, two halls on each side leading off to what I assumed were more offices. The mare looked up from whatever she was doing when we walked off the elevator, and with a big smile she said, Good evening, Dr. Stormy. I'm guessing you're here for the meeting with Nightshade and the others? No, I pulled myself away from my work to go for a walk. Of course I'm here for the meeting. Don't be such a moron and think before you ask such a ridiculous question. I replied. She just giggled. As gloomy as ever, I see. The meeting will be in the last room on the left. Nightshade will be there shortly. But the three high council ponies are already waiting for you. The Pegasus stallion looked towards me and asked, Would you like us to accompany you, ma'am? I don't need a babysitter, I replied, walking past the desk. As I got further down the hall, I heard the power-armored mare say, Why is he always such a bitch? Smiling, I kept going until I was past the rest of the offices. The large set of double doors were right at the end of the hall. I opened one and walked into the large office. Thank the goddesses, it was dimly lit. Sitting around were six ponies around a level oval desk, all pegasi. Three of them, who all sat at the end of the desk, were old. Two were stallions, one a mare. They were all wearing clothes that looked very expensive. They had to be the high council ponies. The other three wore military garb. I assumed they were their bodyguards. As I walked in, the mayor let out an annoyed sigh. Finally. Now, the only ones we're waiting for is Nightshade and Snowdrift. Dr. Stormy, I'm happy you were able to join us today. Figuring there, if there were any pony in the Enclave, Dr. Stormy would show some respect to would be these three. I said, I'm never too busy for you, High Council Mayor. She smiled at that. I see you're in a good mood today, Doctor. Why don't you take a seat? I moved over to the place she indicated and sat. We didn't have to wait long for the doors to open again. And in three, Pegasus walked in. One I knew all too well. It was Stardust, decked out in his blue and black power armor. The symbol of a tribal lion, head on his flank. He didn't even look at me as he walked in, following a white Pegasus with a blue icy mane, who was arguing with a very tall Pegasus stallion. He was wearing a sharp-looking military uniform with a cap to match. In the center of the hat, he had what I assumed was his rank. On the left side of his uniform, he had badges of all kinds. His eyes were covered by a pair of dark glasses, and I couldn't see most of his mane under the hat. But it did look a little dark, poking out from the back. His coat was black, uh, jet black, even darker than my own, and he had a hard look about him. Maybe it was all the small scars that lined his muzzle and cheeks. There was no doubt. That had to be Nightshade. One of the stallions cleared his throat. It's about time you showed up, Nightshade and Snowdrift. Ignoring the stallion, Nightshade looked over at the white stallion, who had to be Snowdrift, and said in a commanding voice, I'm not having this conversation again, Snowdrift. Either you give me what I asked for, or you can pack up your office and go back to Nimbus. 
Now go sit down before I make you. Snowdrift took a step back and said, I'm not going to let you bully me into giving you what I want. I run things here, Council Pony Nightshade, not you. If you argue with me one more time about this, it won't just be your job you have to worry about. Do I make myself clear? Now sit down and shut up, he said. For a moment, I thought Snowdrift was going to keep on arguing, but then he wilted under the stern gaze of Nightshade. Fine, but I'm going to file a formal complaint about this. Ignoring Snowdrift, Nightshade finally turned his attention to the rest of the room. My apologies, High Council members. I hope you all weren't waiting too long for me. The other stallion council, Pony, spoke up. Not at all. We only just got here before Dr. Stormy did. I have to ask you, though, Nightshade, why is he here? He asked, pointing at Nightshade. Tarnus grinned. Why do you care? It's not like I put a tack in your chair or anything. The stallion looked to Stardust angrily. Your arrogance, his constant sarcasm, really pisses me off, Pride. Don't push it. The sins may work for the Enclave, but we still don't like your kind being part of meetings like this. Your kind isn't welcome here. All of you sins are good for as acting as equin weapons to keep order where order is needed. Nightshade spoke up. He is here with me, sir. He's the only sin I trust. Pride isn't like the rest of the sins, and you should all know that. That is, if you've read the reports I've sent regarding this matter. The mayor spoke up next. We have. This new pride hasn't done anything that we would normally consider worth being a sin. Still, his title and position put him in the same category as the rest of them. I laughed a little. Still using the mayor's voice, I said, He's nothing like those tests rejects. Pride is on a whole different level compared to the rest. A perfect specimen. A perfect soldier, if you will. Nightshade looked over at me. His gaze lingered on me for a moment. Good point, Dr. Stormy. He turned his attention back to the rest. He's here because I wanted him to be here, and because I needed him close, right now. The council pony and the mayor's right said, It's not like you to trust one of them this much, Nightshade. Why is this so different? It's simple. I can trust Pride, unlike the rest of them, including their leader, Cloak, he said simply. As you all know, the Seven Sins of Aquinity is one of the reasons I called this meeting. It is also why I wanted us to meet in Mill City Tower. There are less ears here to listen in on what I have to say. The mayor spoke up. Yes, I'd like to hear about this. What were you thinking, Nightshade? He grinned. Not thinking. I've already done. As of two hours ago, I disbanded the Seven Sins of Equinity. They've all been labeled as traitors of the Grand Pegasus Enclave. The same goes for Cloak, a.k.a. Grimoire Spell. One of the stallions, who I thought was a guard, slammed his hoof on the table. Why would you do that? They're the best special ops teams we have. Major, calm yourself. I will explain, Nightshade said. If any of you haven't been keeping an eye on what's been going on in New Pegasus, I can understand why you wouldn't know what's happening. As of now, we have lost three sins. Gluttony, the former pride who was the leader, and just recently, Wrath. They all died fighting this package courier that I know you've all heard about. Yes, but they were trying to kill her because of what she did to the Cloud Layer and her attacks on the Enclave as a whole, the courier mayor said. Nightshade corrected. That is not fully correct. At first, yes, we sent them after her for what she did. But that is not the only reason. I found out that Cloak has been spying on her, using envy ever since she first left her stable. Cloak wants some pickbuck the courier has on her, for reasons she hasn't told the council about. I've ordered Pride and Cloak not to go after her anymore once I found out that the hole she made in the cloud layer was a mistake, and something she wouldn't have been able to do again. I also told them to back down because it wasn't her that first hacked us first, but one of our own who went after her. Either way, the fights the Sins have had with her has proven catastrophic. When she killed Pride, she also took a good part of the Cloud Factory that we had sat over Appleton, killing many Pegasi. Each time we go after her, she does something more devastating, and ponies on the surface are starting to see that. 
If she keeps this up, we will be kicked out of New Pegasus, and all the work we've spent over the past few years to get into that city will have gone to waste. The mayor spoke up again. I don't see why we're disbanding the Sins is a good idea then. And why didn't you get approval from us? Stardust was the one who answered. Because the old Sins don't listen to the Council. The only answer to Pride, the old Pride. Or Cloak, who is hell-bent on finishing her mission. Exactly. As you all know, Cloak has betrayed the Enclave before, when she left twelve years ago so she could try to save her daughter. I personally was surprised when she was allowed back in and put in charge of the Sins, Nightshade said. The Council Stallion on the Mayor's left spoke up. She may have left us in the past, but whatever she's done, she's never stopped being Enclave. You know that as well, Nightshade. She gave us good reason as to why she left and gave us good intel. She has gotten on the three factions that are enemies of the Grand Pegasus Enclave. Be that as it may, she still doesn't answer to anybody but herself. I told her to return to Stratus after she failed to capture the courier, and after she almost got our new pride killed. She didn't do that. She took greed, lust, and sloth with her to lost Olicorn. When she did that, Envy went completely rogue and we lost track of him. I was able to get pride here to make Wrath come with, and just yesterday he was killed by the courier in the ancient ruins just outside the kingdom. Nightshade said. The mayor spoke up again. She had to be the one with the most authority. So, you think we should just disband them because of this? Who will replace them? I knew this was going, so I spoke up. Easy. This pride will make his own group to replace the sins he is ready to complete the program. They will be loyal to us, and not to some random mare who cares more about her own personal gains than that of the Enclave. And that's the plan I had, Stardust said, grinning wider. You may have a point, though I still don't like that you did this without talking to us first, she said. I can explain that in a moment, Nightshade said as he looked towards me. Dr. Stormy, I know I asked you to come up here so that we could talk about some new things and how they were going in the tower, but would you mind stepping out for a moment? The same for everyone else, apart from the High Council. I froze up again for a moment, then finally nodded. Fine. Just don't keep me waiting. I have work to finish up and would rather rather not dilly-dally. He smiled at me. Don't worry. This won't take long. The three ponies that were in the High Council got up and left. Same for Stardust and myself. Snowdrift followed me out, keeping well close. Once the doors to the meeting room was shut and the others were out of earshot, he said, Doctor, I know we don't get along all the time, but I need to know if you destroyed those files. Without looking at him, I said, No, I didn't. I told you I won't do it. He paused, saying, Come with me. Looking back at him, I said, Why should I? Because I don't want the others to hear this. Can you at least give me a few minutes to explain to you why we can't let them find out what we've been doing? He said, opening the door to an empty office. Figuring it wouldn't matter, I sighed and followed. Fine, but it won't change my mind. When I was in the office, he shut the door and locked it behind us, before saying, I know you found those files about me sending aid to the kingdom. If Nightshade... That took me by surprise. This enclave Pegasus was helping Sheena and the Emperor. Shaking my head a little, I asked, That may be true, but I'm not going down with you when they find out. And they will find out. I know, but I'm only doing it to get information on them. I need to build their trust. Once I do, we can finally destroy that fucking place. I frowned. Of course, he wasn't really helping the kingdom. He was trying to destroy them. If that's the case, then why didn't you tell the council that in the first place? Because they wouldn't understand. Nightshade wouldn't allow it. He might act tough and all, but deep down he's a snake. Look how he keeps defending the courier, and how he's getting rid of the sins. He's also the pony who told us not to attack the kingdom, even though they're harboring Dashites, Snowdrift said. You may be right. I'll think about what you said before. I decide. Not for good, though. 
Now, can we get out of this stuffy office? He shot a hoof and grabbed my left foreleg. Wait. I need to ask you one more. He stopped talking as soon as his hoof grabbed my pip buck that was under the sleeve of my lab coat. He pulled me closer before I could do anything else. I lifted the sleeve. You're not Dr. Stormy. I smiled and used my magic to pull off the goggles. No, I'm not. I'm the courier. He was about to scream for help, but he wasn't quick enough. From under the lab coat, I drew the sword and sliced it through his neck. I stepped out of the way before the spray of blood could land on me. His eyes went wide and he gagged, trying to say something. But he couldn't get the words out as the blood poured down his windpipe, just like the doctor. His body fell to the ground as he started to convulse on the ground. A moment later, he was dead. Should have just kept on walking, I said, stepping around the growing pool of blood. I looked down at his corpse, knowing I screwed up. He was going to call for help with one pony. I didn't care that I killed him. What wasn't good was that somebody would notice him missing when the meeting started again. Wait a sec. Why do we care about this meeting anyway? I know what they're doing now. I don't have to keep this up. Looking around the office, I tried to figure a way I could get back to the room without Nightshade knowing. Stardust wasn't far away. And even he wasn't fast enough to stop me from killing Nightshade. Or the other council members, for that matter. When I was in the office during the meeting, I noticed a ventilation opening in the ceiling. But this smaller office didn't have one in it. Well, not one I could find, at least. I went back to the door, cracked it open, and checked to see if any pony was out there. I could hear some ponies talking in the hall, but no pony was in sight. I shut the door, locked it, then teleported back into the hall. It wasn't foolproof, but it would keep any pony from just walking in now. Walking back towards the lobby, I started to look towards the doors I passed. Finally, I found what I was looking for. One of the doors said sanitation on it. If this building was anything like Stable 28, it would have access to the air system. I tried to open the door, but, of course, it was locked, like everything else. Looking down the hall both ways, I checked to make sure no one was watching. Then I started on the lock. It only took a few seconds, and the lock clicked and I pushed the door open. I almost screamed when I first walked in. There was a skeleton hanging from the middle of the small room. He was wearing a janitor's uniform with a name tag that said Grimes on it. Below him, lying on the floor, was a nice-looking long-barreled revolver. Next to it was a note. Closing the door behind me, I relocked it. I picked up the hoof-written note, wondered to myself why he didn't just shoot himself. It would have been a lot quicker. It's been six months since Equestria died. Six months since I've been trying to survive in the wasteland. Most of the buildings in Annapolis have fallen and the dead walk the streets. Ran out of ammo last night. I've been trying to hold up in Mill Teddy's Tower. I know this place better than most, since I used to work here before the world died. I can't go on anymore. I can hear them coming up the stairs. The dead won't stop hunting me, even all the way up here. The streets are flooded with them. My food is gone. I'm almost out of water. And there's no pony who can help me. My wife died in the blast. The dead killed my son. I'm alone. And I'm done. I'm tired. I tried, but I can't do this anymore. Grimes. Sad, but his loss is my gain. Thanks, Mr. Grimes. True to his word, it was empty. But from what I could see, it looked like it used 357 Magnum. Lucky for me, I had quite a few rounds left for old Festus. I tried to give him the wingnut after I let him have the rifle. But he told me when he fixed the rifle, he changed it, so it now used... A 4570 ammo. He said it was more powerful, even if it was harder to find. So I loaded six rounds in the revolver. With that done, I looked around for what I needed. It wasn't hard. On the other end of the room, I'd found it. Most of the ventilation came together and connected in an old heating system. There was part of the vent that I could be pulled away, in case a pony needed to check the ventilation. Just like Stable 28. I walked over to it, opened the panel, and stopped. I don't think I need to keep the disguise up now. I quickly changed back to my barding and duster, pulling off the headband and tucked it into my saddlebags. Then I moved into the vents and, with some effort, reached the top and started to crawl my way towards where the meeting room should be. As I got closer to my destination, voices started to float towards me. At first, they were muffled, and I couldn't make out what they were saying. And that changed when I finally got to a larger vent that was right next to the meeting room. 
Nightshade, I don't care how many times you keep saying it. You still went over our heads, the High Council Mayor said. I looked down at the gate and saw that all three were still sitting at one another table. Nightshade had moved to sit next to them, his darkened glasses sitting him, sitting on the table next to him. I did, and I'll say it again, Torrential Wind. I don't give a shit what you say or what you want. I am not taking your orders again. You've done nothing for our ponies but get them killed in small fights with the Steel Rangers and the NLR. Both Stratus and Nimbus have the highest amount of dashites. Last year alone, we brandished 45 Pegasi from Stratus alone, 34 from Nimbus. Thunderhead only had two last year, and one this year. Navarro hasn't had one in years. If we keep this up, we'll be so weak we won't be able to defend ourselves if Navarro tries to take us over. The mayor puffed herself up as she said, How dare you treat me with such disrespect? You will address me as High Council Mayor, not by my name. Yes, Nightshade, what has gotten into you? The stallion on her left asked. None of you deserve the respect your position calls for. That's why I'm taking over things from now on, Nightshade said. The mayor almost screamed at him. A statement like that is an act of treason, Nightshade. I'd think twice before you utter such things around us again. You're a brilliant stallion, and well-respected amongst the soldiers and citizens. Don't throw away everything you've gained from the past decade just because you're too blinded by power. The stallion on her right spoke next. Yes, do think clearly, Nightshade. Even if you wanted to take over, you couldn't. As you know, council members are elected by citizens. You can't keep this position if they knew what you planned. Nightshade was quiet for a long time. He started to laugh. <laughs> you do have a point. Council ponies are elected. That's how I got this position, as you all know. The thing you seem to forget. A high council pony like all of you is appointed to the position by other high council ponies. Normally it takes years to reach that level of leadership. And the ponies who are chosen are always friends and the ponies who run things. That's right. What's your point? The mayor asked. He chuckled again. Did you know that there's another way to become a high council pony? No, I figured as much. Then let me tell you. If something happens to all the current members of the high council, then a council pony who holds the most top number of votes in the last election is placed as the new high council pony. Seeing as how you three are the only high council in Stratus and Nimbus, if you died, I'd be put in your place. That would give me full control over everything that's happened in both the clouds and on all of the ground cities. That may be true, but if you killed us, you'd never get away with it. You'd be executed, the mayor said, jumping out of her seat and stepping away from the table. This meeting is over. I was confused on what Nightshade was doing. I should just drop in there and kill him and the others. Something about what was being said kept me from doing that. Nightshade was still chuckling to himself. You're right. I'd never get away with killing you. But if some pony, like, let's say, the courier was to do it, then I'd be free to take over. My heart jumped into my throat as he said that. It was like he knew I was up here watching, or at least in the building. I didn't get a chance because one of the stallions said, The courier is a new pegasus. She wouldn't ever get close enough to kill us. You've lost your mind, Nightshade. Just like the rest of your doomed family. Oh, really? If that's what you think, then you really aren't keeping an eye on what's going on in your own cities. The courier is in this tower. She killed Dr. Stormy an hour ago. And I'm sure right now she's killed more ponies in the tower all while trying to figure out a way to find me. Isn't that right, Shadow? Nightshade said, pulling his glasses back on and looking up at me. Why don't you come down and say hello? I tried to turn around and run away before Nightshade could stop me. But the vent was small and I couldn't move fast enough. He flew through the air, ripped the grate, and pulled me out of the tunnel. I tried to kick him, but he held on tight and then gently sat me down on the table. He backed away and stood by the door, watching me. A small smile on his face. All three high council ponies backed away. 
one of the stallions saying, How the hell did she get up there? She's smart. She always seems to find a way to get to a target. Nightshade said with a grin. Introduce yourself, Shadow, and tell the nice old ponies who you are. Wow, someone called me smart for once. I glanced at him, then pulled out the revolver and pointed it right at him. I'd rather blow your frockin' brains out. He shook his head. Now, is that any way to act? Why would you want to hurt me? I never did anything to you. You sent pride after me? Because of him, my friend Orr is dead! I yelled. I'm going to make you pay for taking her away from me. You think I sent pride to go kill your friend? You really should get your facts straight. When I heard what had happened at the ruins, I was furious with pride for what he did. I ordered him to keep an eye on Wrath and if needed to kill him if he went after you, which he did. But at first I wasn't sure why he tried to take you in, but after some digging I figured that out. You're a fucking liar. Nightshade, do something, the mayor said. Quiet, all of you, I'm handling this, he said before looking back at me. Pride was given orders not by me, but by the three of them you see sitting behind you. They're the ones who've been pulling the strings all along. Pride told me when he got back that he was ordered to kill one of your friends and say it was me who ordered it. That way you'd hunt me down. I lowered my revolver a little, then turned to look at the three old pegasi who were pressed against the far wall. Is that true? He's lying to you, a stallion said. We don't even know who you are, just the stories we've been told. Do not lie to her, Nightshade said. You don't know. You know damn well who she is. At first, I wasn't sure who was lying to me. Mom told me in her notes never to trust Nightshade. But I also remembered the other ponies said he was my father's best friend and wanted to protect me. Which story did I believe? Was he the pony who wanted to get the daughter back of his best friend and protect her? Or was he a liar like my mom said? The answer was too easy. My mom lied to me for most of my life. Why would this be any different? Turning the revolver to point at them, I said, I'm Shadowstar, the courier, daughter of Grimoire Spell. I was born in the Crystal Empire and thought to be dead. But I have a feeling you know that already. Don't you? The mayor broke first under my intense gaze. Yes, we know who you are but only because Grimm told us about you being alive when she came back to us. She told us you'd be the pony to give her the key she needed to finish unlocking some pre-war project that would make us the most powerful cloud city in Equestria. My mom thinks I'm dead. She had her memories wiped. How could she have told you any of this? Nightshade spoke up. She told them a week before one of her spells backfired on her. I tried telling her that you were alive ever since you got out of Stable 28, but she won't listen to me or any pony about it. The only pony she trusted was her brother, which you killed. When I found out that the High Council were the ones sending the sins after you just so they could get your pip buck, I started to strike back against them. I turned back to him. If that's true, then why is my friend taking orders from you? I know Pride is loyal to her. Dr. Stormy said as much. Oh, but he wasn't at first. But after I told him that the High Council was betraying the Enclave, he switched sides rather quickly. It's a flaw in his programming. He's loyal to the Enclave as a whole, not leaders who betray it. How can I trust you? I asked. I don't see why I shouldn't just kill you right here and now. He smiled wider. You couldn't, even if you wanted to. I'm a lot tougher than I look. Also, I swore to protect you, and always, I keep my word. Then why should I kill them? Even if they are the ones who told Stardust to kill Aura, what else have they done? I asked. I wanted them all dead, but I needed to know more. How dare you tell her anything else, Nightshade? The mayor said. He ignored her. Dr. Stormy's work was uh, started and funded by those three. Dr. Stormy is the one who ran the program, and they're the reason Stardust was made into what he is. They were also the ones who decided to have his memories wiped. Everything bad that's happened to you from the Enclave, from the Intac, 
at that old FNF tools factory to Frosty Summits, and the sins is because of them. I thought I was angry before. Now, after hearing that I was so much more furious, I swore I could feel like slaughtering every Pegasus in sight. Even Nightshade. He says he wanted to protect me, but he didn't protect my friends. He didn't protect Aura. He's just as responsible as the rest of them, in my mind. I don't care what you say, Nightshade. I can't trust you or any pony else anymore. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't destroy everything here and kill every last pony, including you. Because I'm the only pony that's keeping the rest of the Enclave from coming after you. He opened the door to the office. You can come after me if you want, but I'd suggest you don't. I'm leaving, and I'm taking pride with me. If you play your cards right, you can still save him, you know. I just need a little more time with him to get behind the truth. I'll buy you some time while you take care of those foals. It was nice to meet you at last, Shadowstar. I hope the next time we meet is under better circumstances. Before I could do anything, the door shut and he was gone. The pony I came to kill was getting away, and so was Stardust. But what if he was right? What if he didn't know the whole truth? What if I could save Stardust still? No. I told myself I was going to kill him. No matter what. He still killed Aura. There was no coming back from that. I had to find another way to do this. But for now, at least I could still get some revenge. I looked at the old Pegasus, who still hadn't done anything, but cowered against the wall. Who's first? The stallion on the mare's right said, You won't listen to a crazy pony like him, will you? Then you. I said, aiming down the sights of the revolver and firing. The pony's skull blew apart, splattering the others with bone, blood, and gray matter. Okay, okay. Yes, we sent pride to get you. We told him to only kill a friend of yours if you didn't go with him. It's not like we just outright told him to. The other stallion started to say. I blew his brains out next. I turned the revolver to the mare. Any last words before I send you to hell? She was crying and shaking on the ground. We only did what we thought was best for the conclave. We need that project. Holstering the revolver, I walked closer to put my face an inch away from hers. You should have done more research before you came after me, bitch. Grim lied to you. Don't feel bad, she does it to every pony. I'm the project you wanted. Do you know anything about Grim's daughter? She looked up at me, still crying. Only that she was a sick filly. She went off to find a cure in the dark curse her brother cast on her. We heard you were a white filly, but we figured that it was a mistake once you were out of the stable. I smiled. I was. But when Mom brought me to Project Stargazer, I got infected by something powerful. It did cure me, but it also changed me. I lifted her with my magic. She looked down at me with fear in her eyes. You can't have the power from Stargazer. There's no way a filly could handle that much power inside of her. You would have died. I slammed her head against the wall, then flipped her around and threw her against the window that overlooked the city. Walking over to her again, I watched as she slowly got back to her hooves. Her expensive clothes were ruined by the blood that coated it now. I should have died. That's true. For some reason, though, I just kept surviving. Maybe I'm just lucky. I pulled out Dreamwalker and fired three shots into the window behind the mare. The glass cracked and then shattered. Wind gusted in as the mare felt her to her belly again. Fear played in her eyes. Please, don't kill me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry won't bring Aura back. It won't bring Silver back. It won't save Stardust or my mother. I said, picking up my magic again, and readying my sword to cut her wings off and throw her out the window. Before I could, a pony flew in through the broken window and tackled me. My magic broke, and I dropped the mare on the floor. I readied a spell to fire at whoever had just attacked me, when I noticed who it was. Pinning me down was the stranger, his wrapped face a few inches from mine, his green eyes shining out from under the shadows of his black desperado hat. Don't do this, Shadow. Get off me, I yelled. She's the reason Aura's dead. He hit me in the face, then picked me up with his hooves and pinned me to the wall. I said stop it. She may be the mayor who ordered this, but you still shouldn't be the one to kill her. It's bad enough you already killed two of them. 
The mare tried getting back to her hooves again. As she did, she said, Thank you, sir. You've saved my life. Ignoring her, the stranger got closer to me and said in a low voice, I won't let you destroy yourself just for revenge, especially when you don't have any reason to. I looked at him in shock. I have every reason to. How'd you even know I was here? He rolled his eyes, then hit me in the gut. The air blasted out of my lungs, and I doubled over as he let me go. As I sat before there, gasping for air, the stranger said, I'll tell you later. But right now, I'm not going to let you kill any more Enclave ponies. Not like this. The mare finally got back to her hooves, and she said, Sir, what is your name so I can reward you for saving my life, and for bringing down the mare who's put us through so much trouble? The stallion turned towards her and walked closer. I'm the stallion who protects her. With his back turned towards me, he did something with his bandages around his face. I saw her eyes go wide. You? She said. Replacing the bandages, he said, Yes. Me. As quick as lightning, he jumped back and pulled out his black revolver and fired one shot into her head. When he fired, I saw something glow around the hole in her head for a moment. And the momentum of the bullet stopped, snapped the mare's head back, and she flew out the open window. Gun control of my breathing again, I got up, saying, She was mine to kill! Turning back to face me, his face now covered again, he said, No, she wasn't. I told you, you don't have all the information. This stupid mission of yours is only going to get you killed. I don't care. I want them all dead. Nightshade, Stardust, the whole fucking enclave! I screamed. Before he could answer, gunfire erupted from the other side of the door. The two of us jumped back, the stranger saying, Either way, I'm getting you out of here and bringing you back to the kingdom. Your friends are worried sick about you. Then let them worry. I'm never going back there. I said as I moved towards the door, kicked it open, and threw a grenade at the pegasi down the hall who were trying to kill us. They jumped back behind the far wall, but the explosions still got two before they could get behind cover. Just leave me alone. I gotta go find Stardust and Nightshade and finish what I started. If you aren't listening to reason, then I guess we have to do this the hard way. He said before I could see what he was talking about, I felt something sharp poke in my neck. Reaching up, I felt a small dart there. I pulled it out and looked at the stranger, who was standing there with some sort of makeshift gun. What did you do? I got my answer. My body went mostly limp and numb and fell to the floor. He ran over to me and grabbed me. He flew in the air and out the window right before more gunfire erupted in the hall. I shot you with a weak poison dart. I didn't have enough to make it last long, but it should last till I get you to safety. I tried to say something, but my jaw didn't want to work. Everything felt numb and puffy, like when I was a filly in the dentist's office after he said I'd feel a pinch in my mouth. I noticed, as we flew away from Mill City Tower, that it was starting to get dark out. We didn't go far, just a few blocks away where he was setting me on a roof of a three-story building. When he did, he sighed, saying, That's better. Sometime, Shadow, I swear you have a death wish. Concentrating hard, I was able to move my muzzle enough to speak. Slowly, but I could still talk. I'll make you pay for this. He smacked me again. For what? Saving your life? You even know why I'm here? To be a pain in my ass? No. Some pony calling himself Watcher contacted me when I was in the kingdom, talking to your friends. He told me where you were going and what you were planning on doing. I came here as fast as I could. Some zebra named Khalid told me you went into the tower a while ago. He told me that you promised to get his help, for his mother and whatnot, when you were done. Don't worry, I'm going to help him with his mother, for you, once I'm done dealing with you. He said, his voice growing in anger as he talked. This won't stop me. I'm going to kill them. Even if you do bring me back to the kingdom, I replied. I can already feel the poison wearing off. Nightshade isn't your enemy, Shadow. He's just as guilty as the rest of them. He didn't do anything to stop Stardust when he came after me. He didn't know until after it was done. Who do you think first sent me to find you when Winter Frost found you? Nightshade did. He's been looking for you for weeks. He even did everything he could to try and help you save Stardust. He can't show all his cards yet. 
but he is on your side. If you kill him, nothing will stop whoever replaces him from coming after all of you. He's not a bad pony, the stranger yelled. My mom told me he can't be trusted, I said, but I knew I wasn't going to win this. The more he said, the more I realized how stupid I've been. Grim doesn't trust any pony, Shadow. She hasn't for years. She's paranoid. Ever since she left the Enclave, she was always afraid that some pony was going to come and take you away from her. And that's why she said not to trust him. She wants you all to herself. Finally, I lowered my gaze and let a few tears fall. This whole time, it was Mom who I couldn't trust. Even before she turned into what she was now. I wouldn't say you can't trust her. But when it comes to Nightshade or none of your family, she won't have anything nice to say about them. She can't change who she is. You can trust Nightshade if you don't believe what he's said to you, then trust me. Feeling came back to my legs and slowly I got back to my hooves and sighed, looking up at the tower that still loomed over the city like a black pillar of death. At the top, I saw it must have been a raptor flying away and into the clouds, an escort of pegasi following behind it. As I flew off, I asked the stranger, How do I forgive Stardust? You have to find a way. Remember, he isn't himself right now. The stranger replied, Think about it like this. What would Stardust do if he was in your place? I knew what he would do. The problem was, the stranger thought he did, but he didn't. Can I ask you something? What is it? He asked with a sigh. He looked worn out. His eyes were looking down at his hooves. Is there a cloud city above the Twin Cities? No. Nimbus is more southeast of here. Why do you ask? Because I don't want more innocent ponies to die because of the monsters who run the Enclave, I said as I pulled out my last resort. Solar Flare's rangefinder slid out of my saddlebags. I pointed it right at the top of the tower. The stranger looked up and saw what I had in my magical grip. He jumped and yelled, No! Don't! But he wasn't fast enough. I pulled the trigger and watched as a small red beam flew out at the end of the strange gun. A much larger symbol formed on the outside of the building, right as the stranger tackled me. I was laughing as he took the rangefinder away from me. It's too late. Nothing can stop it once it's fired. The screen did what it did before, saying something about matching DNA. Then it said more about lining up the shot. He looked at the screen in horror. There has to be some way to stop it. You can't do this, Shadow! Turn it off! I looked up at him and smiled. No, I can't. Even if I could, I wouldn't. That building houses most of the ponies in the, who run the Twin Cities for the Enclave. And if I'm lucky, Stardust is still in there. You told me what to do, but he would if he was in my place. This is it. He would avenge his friend if I ever did anything as bad as he did. No, he wouldn't. He would have tried to save you. Shadow, make it stop. A slightly yellow glow from the four beams of light came crashing down through the cloud layer. As they did before, they expanded, closing Mill City Tower in a thin barrier that went up to the heavens. The clouds that were trapped in the barrier vanished in seconds, showing the beautiful blue sky beyond. It looked a little green because of the barrier's color, but it was still a sight for that most ponies never saw. Stranger, this can't be stopped. Either kill me, or just watch what happens next. I don't care either way, I said as the rangefinder beeped. Target locked. Solar flare firing. Please stand back. A rushing sound filled the air, following a blinding light that slammed into the tower. It crashed right through, lighting up the city like a sun had shown itself right in the center of Annapolis. Then, the beam of deadly light expanded until it touched the barrier. Like before, it only lasted about ten seconds. Only this time, the barrier held. Fred must have weakened it before when he tried to escape. The light vanished a second later, and so did the thin yellow barrier. The dust blew out into the city, but apart from that, there was nothing left. The skyline, where Mill City Tower had once dominated the Winapolis skyline, was gone. All that was left was a glowing crater and a little bit of rubble that wasn't destroyed in the blast itself. When I first fired Solar Flare, I was scared of the destructive power it had. Now I only smiled. No pony in that place was worth saving. I showed the Enclave once again. I wasn't a mare that they should mess with. Shadow, how could you have done that? Easy. 
I hate everything that place stood for. This is the price they pay for killing the ones that I love. He rounded on me. I told you before that you're a fool. I don't know if I can save you from the shadow, but I'm going to try. You're going back to the kingdom with me. No, I'm not. I have to make sure Stardust was in that blast. If he wasn't, I'm going to hunt him down like he did to me, I retorted, getting back to my hooves and pulling the rangefinder back in my saddlebags. Don't follow me, stranger. If I see you again, I'll kill you too. I started walking away, but the stranger walked in front of me. No, you're going back to the kingdom. I readied the spell to blast him out of my way. I'm not going. He didn't let me finish. That wasn't a request, Shadow. He quickly pulled out a memory orb from one of his pockets and pressed it on my glowing horn. My magic connected and there was a spark. Before the memory of whatever he had took hold, I thought to myself, I'm going to kill you for this. The world melted away, and with it all hope in getting my revenge. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Wolf in sheep's clothing. Rank 2. You've pretty much mastered disguise and the art of deception. You can now use various different disguises to your advantage, even when in close proximity to the enemy. Be warned, though, allies that have a close relationship to the pony you're pretending to be could potentially see through your disguise. Dark perk added. Cold-blooded. Wow, you've gone pretty dark. With your moral compass turning the way it has, you now have an easier time making the decision to kill some pony, rather than sparing them, and can quickly think of killing in the cruelest ways imaginable. Note, this perk also weakens the seal holding Aquila. Be careful of the choices you make in the future.